Welcome everybody to the World Wise Web. A pleasure to see you all here today. Some old and familiar faces that haven't been seen for a while. Good to see you. The World Wise Web is an attempt of a group of social and technological designers to create a wise stack together. How do we create the foundation for the way that we connect online and infuse into it the spirit of wisdom? And in that spirit, as always, we begin the sessions of the World Wise Web with a short meditation. So I invite you to meditate for two minutes. I'll set a timer. Feel free to turn off your camera if that's what you prefer. And we'll take two minutes to let things settle before we enter into this space together. Starting in three, two, one, go. And that is two minutes. Thank you for joining in that moment of meditation. We found it very valuable to set the scene whenever we've joined together and create a moment of peace before entering into the complexity. Today, Many of us from the World Wise Web are gathered here and we're going to present to you the results of the last three months that we've been meeting together. We started in the middle of January. In fact, we met for three months before that as part of the prelude of the build up to the actual beginning. But we started in earnest the middle of January and we've been meeting twice a week for two hours each time. This has allowed us to build up a rhythm and momentum around the work that we've done. 
And today, at last, we have an opportunity to share up to where we have arrived at the middle of this journey. To begin, I'm going to pass over to James to give us a bit of context about why are we gathering as this group and what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, so I've uh, written up a little intro here uh, because like Lawrence said, I wanted to kind of start by providing some of the broader context on the why of the World Wise Web before Lawrence then gets into the, the what and the how. Uh, so as many of you will probably agree, our global civilization appears to be facing a multitude of serious crises and our current political, economic and social institutions don't seem to be up to the task of addressing them, at least in the timescales that are available to us. But we believe that humanity as a collective already has what's required to address these challenges now. The intelligence, the creativity, the wisdom, skills, tech and resources. The problem is that we're lacking the social infrastructure necessary to coordinate effectively at scale and really tap into this reservoir of potential. The internet and social networks already enable billions of people to communicate and share ideas and capital instantaneously around the planet. But the design of these tools is largely driven by profit incentives, not our collective well-being, which has led to addictive behavior patterns, data harvesting for private interests, and all under dictatorial governance that we have little say over. So is there another option? Um, to see the vision we're holding, I want you to imagine a new scenario. And in this case, I'll use Facebook as an example, as it's a tool that we're all familiar with, but you could imagine Twitter or other social networks. And our vision actually goes way beyond the functionality that these tools are offering. Uh, but we'll start with that to keep it simple. So imagine Facebook, but imagine instead that it was owned collectively by humanity instead of a small group of wealthy and attached shareholders. And we had a real voice in shaping the design of the platform, our communities and our personal news feeds, instead of having that dictated to us from above. Imagine if our data was in our control instead of for sale to the highest bidder behind our back and we could choose to offer it voluntarily or even be paid to share it for causes that we support. Imagine if surplus profits generated by this system, which at scale could be in the billions, were pulled together each year and dedicated to helping the world. And we got to propose ideas and vote together on how it's redistributed. And imagine if this social network also became the testbed for radically new forms of democracy and collective representation that could be experimented with and refined over time, independent of national governance. Right now, we effectively get two bad options every four years, and that's our input to the political systems that define our lives. It doesn't have to be this way. Modern democracies were designed before the internet and smartphones, and the technological landscape has shifted dramatically since then, opening up all kinds of new possibilities. With a new open source cooperative network like this, we wouldn't have to wait for them to evolve. We could do it ourselves independently. All of this seems to be within reach. We just need to bootstrap the system and facilitate its growth. And I believe that there's a gap in the market for this and the potential for the rapid scaling once uh, enough of this tech is in place. So if we could achieve something like this, it could enable us to help clean up the information ecology we're all swimming in, to evolve future governing systems um, and move forward our governments and redistribute resources to meet desperate needs that are currently overlooked by market incentives. So to summarize, the reason why we're working on this tech is that we believe that mapping out, prototyping and contributing to the birth of a new global social architecture like this could be the key that helps us to unify our species in a completely new way and focus our collective wisdom to address the root causes of the meta crisis. Thank you, James. Well said. We'll continue with the session with a little bit of the story of the World Wide Web and how it came to be. And then we'll be seeing presentations from the various members showing the technology which they've already created. And then we'll move towards the synergy that we've been working towards. The new stack that we're building upon and the seed app 
the first app that we're going to start growing upon this substrate. So the history of the World Wide Web, it grew out of two things. One was a frustration with past groups that a few of us had been a part of where something similar had been attempted. A number of people who are working on technological solutions to these great issues, coming together and trying to figure out how do we collectively bring our energy together and create the thing that we need to create. One of them was the Liminal DAO, which you might have been part of, or the Metacrisis DAO, and there were a number of other which have been in the past. And what a friend of mine and myself recognized was that there was typically a few things that got in the way of these groups being able to get something done. One was there was a lack of structure. There was a signal put out, something needs to be done, join here, let's do something. But that wasn't sufficient. It needed to have more clarity, more direction behind it. And two, the, the challenge of each individual to put aside at least a part of what they were doing to join together with other people and to, and to collaborate. Because what would happen again and again was that there was no direction in the group. And then somebody would propose, oh, why don't we put my project in the middle? And then everybody would not directly, but kind of subtly say, oh yeah, but well, I actually also have something which we could put in the middle. And I also have something that we can put in the middle. So why should we put your thing? And then in the end, nothing got put in the middle and nothing got done. And these groups had incredible people who were part of it. And over a few months, typically, they would fall apart and all that potential would be lost. So when my child was born, I had a series of cascading insights about how to build the technology that we needed to uh, infuse the spirit of wisdom into the, the, um, the substrate. And I want to give a shout out to Charles here to over and over bringing out wisdom over intelligence because I lie. I, I thought that I had the key to collective intelligence and then it was Charles who pushed forward that no, collective intelligence is not enough. What we need is wisdom. And so uh, with these series of insights came this sense of urgency. Okay, something needs to be done. And uh, I was having these conversations with a friend about this and we came with the idea, okay, we're going to do something like Lamar DAO, something like Metacrisis DAO, but we're going to facilitate it. We're going to provide structure and we're going to facilitate it. And in that way, we hope we're going to be able to get these nerds to get some shit done. <laughs> and um, so I started reaching out to various people in the network. And the uh, provided a frame. Okay, so uh, here's a, a basic frame of what we can do. Together, we can try and collectively build the technology which we need to be able to self-organize. And with that technology, we can then figure out what it is exactly which we want to continue growing together. So if we could figure out the, that seed, if we can figure out that, that the substrate and the seed, then we can start a growth pattern which would serve not only for ourselves, but would serve for all of the other adjacent communities within our network. And, and I came with my own prejudices, with my own ideas, which I wanted to impose on the group. And over time, they were justly diluted, reduced, and purified, as with all of the other people in the group. As we came together, 
joining regularly, always in the spirit of wisdom, and we adopted a minimum definition of the right relationship between part and whole that both may evolve, which is not a perfect definition, but which is good enough. And by concentrating on connecting in one-on-one -on -one as much as possible, which we valued equally important as the group calls, we cultivated a web together, a web of relationships. And through those conversations, we came to understand each other's ideas better and better. I remember, for example, the, um, the, the breakthrough in understanding which I had when I finally met with Brad for a one-on-one, -on -one, when he'd been explaining his ideas for a long time into the group, and it was only when I had time to one-on-one -on -one with him that everything suddenly makes sense. And I was like, of course. And that is absolutely crucial. That attunement to each other's vocabulary, to each other's understanding, we realized is absolutely key. And these are all the ideas that we've been bringing together to uh, infuse into this substrate and to this app that we're building. Okay, let me just check the schedule because I know that time is tight. We have many people who want to present something. So that feels about five minutes. That feels about right. So I will, I will uh, just to, to quickly summarize the, the following of the session, we're going to have uh, five or six or, yeah, five, six, seven different presentations of various parts of the tech. And we're going to have a Q&A at the end, which hopefully will last 30 minutes. We're going to be, we're going to try and be as tight as possible with the time because we're very eager to converse with you all about uh, what we've been doing and, and what you think, whether you think we're in the right direction, um, what we could do to improve. And uh, on that note, I will pass over to James as our first presenter to tell us about WECO. Cool. Let me just share my screen. Is this working? It is. Cool. Yeah, so over the last three or four years, I've been working on this platform, Wico, which is kind of a bit like I was discussing in the intro. It's a, um, a kind of a, an experiment and a test bed for exploring new approaches to social media. So it draws on a lot of the features that you would see in other social media platforms. So you can create communities uh, and you can create posts and there's different types of posts which have different types of media. Uh, you can comment on posts, um, like them, sort them by different metrics, etc. cetera. Um, but, uh, and there's a lot of different details, but for the sake of keeping it short, I'll just focus on some of the unique features uh, that Wico has been experimenting with um, rather than going into all the details. So one of the first things that makes Wico unique um, is the way that we're organizing spaces or communities on the platform. So to explain this kind of this new approach of organization, which we, we kind of call it a holonic design because you can have communities nested within communities. Uh, but one, re one way of thinking about why we've done this is if you imagine, let's say that you, uh, you, know, you have a load of files that you store on your computer, but imagine that you could put those files into folders, but you couldn't create subfolders. So you could have you know, a folder for music, you could have a folder for photos or whatever, but when you go into those, you couldn't have subfolders to organize stuff or further subfolders within that. You know, it provides a basic amount of organization, but the more content you have on your computer, the harder and harder it's gonna to get to actually navigate through that. But when we come to the world of social media, like platforms like Facebook and Reddit, um, uh, you, you're able to create these kind of con social containers for communities, but you're very limited in terms of the organization beyond that initial category. So you could create a, you know, a liminal web space on Facebook, uh, a group, but you, you really can't do effective organization within that. And so for, for small communities up to a certain scale, you know, just having a basic container where people can share posts, you know, it's, it's sufficient. Um, but the problem is as these communities start to scale and the amount of content being 
shared each day you know goes beyond a certain limit suddenly it starts to get overwhelming and you've got all this content kind of squashed into this one space and so one way that we're approaching that is to basically give people the ability to create unlimited nested subcategories so um, here you can see this kind of this tree visualization uh, and all the communities are, are sorted by different metrics so you can you know they're sorted by likes at the moment you could sort them by total posts and it will reorganize it and you can you can obviously search these communities as well um, but say you have a community like science so it's a uh, for all science related stuff but then you can expand that and within that you can have these different subcategories and within each of those you can have further subcategories and there's really no end to the limit of um, how deep you want to go in terms of the, the categorization so one of the nice things about this is it means that you know as you're exploring through the site rather than just having to kind of search by text-based search you can actually have this kind of visual tree-based uh, exploration where you can find the general subject you're interested in and, and you can kind of narrow your <clears throat> the scope of your focus down to more and more specific areas um, and the way that kind of content is integrated here basically you know there's we've got ideas about how this can be evolved further but at the moment when you post something to a public space let's say like neuroscience down here that post will show up there to anyone visiting the neuroscience space but it also gets aggregated in each parent above. So the biology space not only includes posts directly to biology, but it's also aggregating posts together, posts from neuroscience, cytology, genetics, and all of the subcategories. So, uh, and, then, and then this repeats at each higher level. So again, science is integrating all the content from biology and all of those lower levels, as well as physics and everything there. So what it allows you to do is you can kind of choose the scope of focus. So if you wanna see just the top news across all of the science related communities, rather than having to hop across lots of different communities as you would have to on Reddit or Facebook, you can actually just go to this one location and it's pulling together all of the stuff from all of the related subcategories into one location. But at any point, you're free to kind of narrow that scope by hopping down the tree further. Um, a couple other things about this. Um, so a space is, not restricted to one location so you can actually have a space like uh, let's find an example so we've got biochemistry which is what you see when i hover over it it actually is highlighting this other instance here so biochemistry actually exists in both of those locations simultaneously within biology and chemistry so um, you're really free to connect spaces wherever they make sense in this broader holarchy of, of uh, categories um, and another thing is that it's it's really designed to evolve over time. So one problem is, you know, if you imagine allowing people to create holarchies, uh, but it's it's kind of controlled by, say, the moderators of science, and they get to dictate, you know, how the rest of the the ontology is structured. Well, that would obviously be problematic for various reasons. So we've tried to make it so that this holarchy can actually self-organize over time. So as I mentioned earlier they're listed at the moment from left to right based on their ranking according to at the moment how many likes are in each um, on on the posts within each space but you could rank it by other metrics and we could add other ones as well onto this and the idea is that it kind of sifts to the surface the most relevant or the most active communities so people could create you know people could actually create multiple competing biology spaces but the ones that are actually being used over time sift to the surface and the ones that are, end up dying or kind of withering away, they fall down, down the list. Uh, so you can actually have competition and natural selection operating at each level of the holarchy. Uh, and that can happen at each level below as well. And, you know, like I said bef before, people can locate their space in, in multiple places. So if they started out and there was a good biology space, but then over time it died, you know, the genetic space, the ecology space, they could unlink from that old one and attach to a new one. And the idea is that this actually enables these kind of complex holarchies to evolve over time, not based on some kind of top-down moderators de defining the ontology, but actually uh, through a bottom-up process um, where all of the users' interactions are shaping and evolving the holarchy over time. Um, so that's one of the key things, how we're organizing spaces. Another thing that I wanted to quickly touch on is that we've got this concept of uh, the link map. So um, if I just go back up to all, 
all is the kind of the the global parent public hold on by the way which everything feeds into so this is where you'd see the top stuff across the whole site um so now what i want to two do minutes is, left james say that again two minutes left two minutes left okay um so just one one last thing i wanted to quickly touch on is um the link map so uh, i'm going to sort it by links so another unique feature on Wiko is this ability to link content together. So we have this, this concept of the link map. So if I click here, you'll see this. This is kind of messy, and this is a this is like a prototype. So we're we obviously want to develop more intuitive interfaces for this. The basic idea is that anything can be linked to anything else. So you can link a user to a post, a post to a comment, you know, to a space, whatever in whatever combination you want, and you can describe the relationship between those two items. And then other people can also then go and like those links. So you can actually get a kind of a weighting of these connections. And it enables a kind of collaborative knowledge graph to evolve connecting items all across the platform to each, to each other. Um, and it's, again, not shaped by one person, but it arises out of the collective. So any item you arrive on, uh, if the site was active enough, you would see recommendations, not based on algorithms, but based on members of the community. Um, and those could be filtered in lots of interesting ways. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it there. There's lots more to the platform, but um, for the sake of time, I'll hand it back and um, let some of the others present. Thank you very much, James. Sharp on the time, 30 seconds left. Uh, allow me to continue on the theme of Wiko shortly, and I'll present a few other features that Wiko has. Can, ev can everybody see this screen and somebody can give me an audio confirmation? Yep, we're good. Great, thank Same. you. Okay, so something which is cool about Wiko is, is that you have many different post types. Uh, for example, you have things like text, images, you have audio, which is something fun to play with. And so you can create like these uh, sequences of audio clips, like share conversations in the search, share podcasts, and then you have polls. So you can do polls together, and then you have these, these uh, visual visualizations. You can visualize the amount of votes, their distribution. You can see how they evolve over time. And then you have the Glassby game. And the Glassby game is one of the wisdom practices that we've been playing during the play along, during this playful hackathon that we've been doing over the past three months and which is going to continue for another three months. And on the Tuesdays, we've been doing wisdom practices and on the Thursdays, we've been getting shit done. So we have this by rhythm, which allows us to come together to cultivate the collective wisdom. And then on the other gathering, we then say, okay, so what do we need to do? And let's plan it and let's do it. So the Glassbeak game, this is uh, a game that you can play on Wiko, which allows people to, to co-create an exploration of a topic together. And the, the way that it works is that each person takes their turn to speak about uh, a topic. So in this case, it's society. Um, in fact, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this room because there's, there's this YouTube video of the fractal zoom, although fascinating, might be a little bit distracting. So allow me to open another. So here we go. So here's one which is called What is Wisdom? And this is a, a game where that people have taken turns to write about what they think wisdom is. And it allows you to create this string of a whole conversation broken down into its parts. And this is an example of a game which is played asynchronously. So people can play whenever they want. They can just jump into the game. And anybody could actually jump in here by just clicking to create the next bead. You would then be able to add your move to this game. But right now, I would like to share with you a game which was played in, uh, in real time. Because what that allows you to do is to connect together in this room on Wiko 
and to, in real time, take turns to talk about a topic. So here it was meaningful interpersonal connections. And you set a timer at the beginning for the exact amount of time that each person is going to play for. So here it was one minute moves and we played for a total of 10 minutes. And as you play, you connect together through the streaming. So it's like this Zoom kind of experience. And you run the timer. And when it's your turn, it records and uploads your bead, as, it, as it's called, your part of the conversation. And then once the next person, it records their part and uploads it to the platform. And what that allows you to do is it brings this distinction between the parts and the whole. It allows each person to really concentrate on what they're saying. They, they don't worry about whether they're going to be interrupted or not. They know that they have the time to relax into what they need to say. And then the next person gets to speak. And seeing that there's an equality of time, you have this feeling of reciprocity, which grows as well. So th this is an example of the wisdom practices that we've been practicing. They're, they're ways of, of bringing this part-whole relationship to light, knowing that it's not just by playing these games or meditating a bit that suddenly we're going to be wise, but by practicing these practices, we can maintain at least a minimum metabolism that hopefully is strong enough to uh, digest our own bullshit. And that's, that's the, what we need to continuously work against is that if we can get to that threshold of just bringing a little bit less bullshit to when we're meeting together, then we massively enrich the conversation. So that was the glass bead game. Uh, I will now pass over to, oh, in fact, one last thing, sorry. Uh, allow me to share what um, the esteemed Nick Redmark has been working on, which is an expansion of the glass bead game. And what it allows people to do is that you can, um, where's, where's this link? You can, you can customize your own type of game. So rather than playing the, the glass bead game, you can design your own practice so that you can develop an ecology of practice. Now, I'm not going to go into more details here. I just posted a video into the chat that you can look at when Nick explains it. And it is really interesting and really promising. So on that note, I will pass over to Brad and Charles to talk about Nunao. Brad, you're muted. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Lawrence et at, al. At it's great to be here. Um, so I'll just have a quick quick bunch of slides I'll whip through to kind of give you some context and then show you some of the pieces we've been working on. Uh, James did a great job. Everybody can see my screen. besides chaos and fascism and you know basically we want it to be regeneration um how long do we have uh, not very long in my opinion you know capitalism is going to eat the world and that's if nothing else we have to come up in, in within 20 10 20 years a serious you know replacement for capitalism and that's a that's a tall order um so the original provocation for this work uh, kind of started with a conversation I had with Daniel Schmachtenberger, where 
I asked him this question, like, what hope do we have of, of navigating the meta crisis? And then, uh, and then he asked it back to me. And my answer was, you know, that a, you know, we need to, you know, make regeneration that that worldview, that the third attractor worldview, but more importantly, that we could manifest the regenerative movement as a virtual nation, uh, something that you know has the the capacity to, to have real agency on the global stage, comparable to like the, the Catholic Church or more, right? And and my world has been liquid democracy since about 2005. And so the vision is if you could span the network, the, the, the movement as networks of trust and respect, and then use the, the inherent capacity of, of networks to uh, coordinate in, in new ways, then that's, is that, that there is hope, right? That was at least that's what's driven the hope for me in terms of working on this stuff, new levels of what we call coordination that are possible through large networks. Is a wide social brain possible? Well, we'll find out, but it, it, the way it's, the way we've approached it is through essentially human neural networks. Uh, we're kind of calling them networked autonomous organisms. You could think of them as DAOs with, with uh, whose memberships are, are real networks, starting with people of vision, grown by invitation, trust and respect, et cetera. Um, but mainly to outcompete current systems. Network cooperative is the vision for how it would manifest legally. Um, and, you know, a new organizational form, essentially a cooperative, but that's, that's governed through these network, this network coordination. Uh, one key thing is that we really aren't networks of networks. We don't, we're not, at least not digital. We're a bunch of disjoint mailing lists. Limicon, for instance, is just a bunch of names, right? There is no persistence there currently. Um, so we need to make them accessible to software. And that's kind of the big opportunity is, um, sorry, is, uh, is to actually manifest our relationships as edges in a graph. That's kind of the, the big vision is a shared social substrate that, that captures some level of our respect for each other in, in domain specific areas that could become a, a, um, uh, the, the foundation for an ecosystem of, of applications. Stigmergy is a big part of it where we're marking each other and these become edges in a graph. So the core concepts are we built everything on a graph database, RangoDB. It's centralized now, decentralized as fast as we can. Decentralized identity is definitely um, part of the part of the plan and system. Proof of personhood is required. If you're going to make collective decisions, you got to, you have to be civil. You have to be civil resistant and collusion resistant. If you once you have that, you could have portable communities because I can have a, a consistent identity that. that spans lots of different communities, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll do a quick demo. Um, let's see here. So in, one of the, Daniel introduced me to the Emerge Network. Uh, and part of what, where we started was basically to kind of prototype a, uh, a large network that can show what's possible. So we've actually started scraping LinkedIn um, and so, and I worked with Thomas Bjorkman, uh, the founder of Emerge, to kind of map the people who were going to that that conference. And so this is uh, not working. There it is. So this is Thomas's network, um, and these are these are all LinkedIn edges, uh, and we can go into details about what there are. But but basically, basically starting with Thomas and the people he's connected to, and the people I'm connected to, and Charles and June Holly and a few others, we're up to about 300,000 people who are at most two degrees of separation from 10 different people. So it kind of simulates what's possible. Um, you can also do, uh, and so if you want to dig into this more, I'm having some, some uh, connection problems here. Dig into it more, you can go to now.is. There's a lot of detail in here. Uh, in particular, we, uh, we did play with um, just taking the list of names for people from the liminal web and, and just, so these are, these are connections that, that we, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's liminal web, not limicon. So we took a, a, a list of names, uh, attendees from limicon and ran it through our lens of who's connected to whom 
these people out here are not, we don't know about any of their connections, but these people here, uh, we have connections in our system already um, that you can get when you mouse over each one. Um, so that's kind of building up of that. Uh, green check is an important component of this. This is our proof of humanity, uh, civil resistance. So the idea is you have a variety of marks that you can do. You can claim your, so these are my, these are my claims attributes. I've proven I've, I own them. Uh, the timeline is who's, who's claimed who or who's validated. So Charles praised David Rugg. Uh, Simon claimed a couple of accounts. People validate, uh, Steve validated Dave Waterbury. So these are creating edges in the graph. Um, praise, for instance, is, um, we can look at leaderboards here. Charles, for instance, uh, is, uh, so the idea is I can put praise Charles. The blues here are my dimensions of praise for him. I didn't actually praise him for juggling. I don't know how good of a juggler he is. Um, and then the grays are other people's vector, uh, dimensions to his, this is his collective uh, respect vector and the blues are my respect vector, my, my personal respect vector to him. Um, and then the idea um, is to do this at scale where people capture their uh, a little bit of what they know about each other into digital form. Uh, this is a bioregional mycelia uh, approach to that where I can go to, for instance, Amazonia and people can nominate other people as uh, knowledgeable about that bioregion and then um, vote on each other's uh, each other's uh, nominations, etc. Two lots minutes, of uh, Brad. Yeah, thank you. Lots of interesting stuff to be done there. Um, we, I guess, Charles, do you have anything? I was kind of trying to keep it short. Uh, what am I forgetting? Well, Best of Now is a, is a social bookmarking tool that we built. Basically, everything is nodes and edges, right? People, people link to people. People link to documents. This is a social bookmarking system that's mostly been, been. Um, uh, I don't know if there's probably anything. Yeah, so probably, yeah. So this, these are just bookmarks that Charles or I have done or a few other people, uh, but it easily could be, uh, it's kind of like delicious for groups. And then we've been working a lot on this stack, um, which uh, we're going to get into in more detail, but the core idea from my perspective is this social substrate that we build through these edges is a shared graph. James mentioned this in his intro. This is, it's a shared graph. It, ha it can't be owned by any corporation. It has to be collectively owned. And that would be as where each person has self-sovereign control over their part of the network and can, can agree to share it with communities. And that forms a massive social graph that can be governed as a network cooperative. And then that becomes a platform for app e an ecosystem of apps. So any app that complies with the principles of this, of this co-op uh, could get access to the user community and thus have a much easier time getting traction because they don't have to go and convince you know, people to adopt their system whole whole communities can adopt uh, a new application so uh i guess i'll leave it there i, I just quickly jump in and say it's been really great Rad, rad working together closely for almost two years now and jamming increasingly with wico shortly thereafter and basically just to zoom out it's a toolkit that's that's got a lot of functionality and a lot more sort of in the queue and sort of indicated uh, on there. The UX is not yet fancy. I think um, Wico holds a lot of promise. And and again, the portable communities idea is to not be beholden or stuck on or in any particular tool and platform to be able to, to ro roam around within this network cooperative uh, framework. So thanks. Yeah, that's a, those are important points. Um, one is what we're working on in terms of the, in the context of the World Wide Web is like, how can we re-implement some of this stuff in a decentralized way in ways that share uh, toolkits and, and plugins and all that. So uh, a lot of what we've done is basically just prototypes, but it's, you know, quite functional. 
And uh, the portable communities is a really important concept because, and I mentioned- Minus one minute, guys. Being, are we over? Yes. Okay. Back Done. to you. Thank you, Brad and Charles. Uh, over now to uh, Roberto, who's going to present some elements of his vision of Theos. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? We can. Great. OK, so I'll talk about Holons, which is an implementation of the Holonic Earth Operating System Protocol. And it's something we've been working here at the Liminal Village, which is uh, a proto game B place where we really try to experiment and create the future we want to live in and experiment with the technologies that, uh, that are going to enable that. So um, why are we doing that is because I think if we are looking at the economy as the issue, uh, economy actually means household management. And so if we are able to manage a household using the technology, then we can scale it up um, in the same way. And then we can manage our common house, which is planet Earth. So a Holon, uh, for who doesn't know about it, is a, a evolving self-organizing structure that could be composed about, about other Holons. And it's simultaneously a whole. And uh, at the same time, it's nested within another holon, so it's also a part of something that is larger than itself. And a little bit all the pieces in the World Wide Web have that feeling as well. They are whole and also a piece of something else. So um, the idea is that we need to look at the way that we structure and coordinate with each other. And uh, if you're looking at traditional organization, uh, a new organization that is actually running across the planet but it's not bound by somebody funding it. It's actually looking more of like a relation across multiple people, a team of teams in a way, where the organization looks like the relation between the people. And so, for instance, if there is a Holland of me and there is an Holland of you, we might actually come together and realize that we share some values and objectives. And so we can create a, a new Holland, the Holland of us, and then we find out that maybe them, uh, there's another Holland, other people have been also forming Hollands and before and so on. And this can actually happen in a very organic uh, at different levels and can actually be also re-entrant. So another metaphor is actually a, a almost like a natural succession that uh, will bring the desert where we currently live in into a forest of human uh, uh, collaboration. So basically, we, want, we need an infrastructure that is able to create all fractal me membranes for any reason. And, uh, um, but an idea we had was like, hey, let's actually meet the people where they are. Because people are already forming membranes into the social uh, media applications, uh, social messaging. Um, so we actually have created a bot for Telegram. Uh, where you can just basically dump this bot into your pre-existing membrane, which is your group. You, you're already bound by some reason. And this bot will, but it's, this is not limited to Telegram. This is just the first one we're doing. As I say, we're working with the protocol. And um, if you dump this into your uh, membrane, you basically get a set of uh, tools that are going to be able to help your community uh, organize tasks, coordinate governance, uh, mutual credit system, communicate needs and offer, and so on. is really like a, a big uh, toolkit for community. Um, for instance, here is a, just a task. You can just write slash task and then the, the name of the task, and then you get these buttons. And with these buttons, then people can inter interact with that knowledge that uh, now we're, uh, that there is a task. And uh, you can choose to participate or appreciate or stop the task or schedule it and so on. And why would you uh, do this? This is not just a simple kind of icon that goes into that. This actually has a meaning. It has a function. And uh, the function of giving appreciation, for instance, uh, it's, is a way to highlighting the community, what the community is actually liking uh, for other people to do. So through this signal, we can actually build some sort of like a balance sheet or like a score sheet where um, 
we actually have, we can see at, the, at a glance uh, what is the status of the community who has been collaborating or appreciated more for what has been bringing into that group. And that completely depends on the group, how this is calculated. And we can use, then use the kind of signal to actually share any rewards that actually come back to the group. We can actually divide that reward according to this uh, signal. And let me give you an example. So if you have a project and the project have dependencies or department for the less technicals, uh, and the, dep the dependencies have more dependencies and they're linked in this way, we can actually use these technologies or, or this information to give it a score on how much we're appreciating that department or that dependency so that when the money is coming in, it can actually flow according to this bandwidth. So, and you can enter. necessarily have to do it only uh, on project you can actually do it at the local level and we're basically experimenting at this moment really also a bi regional network that we want to expand this technology to so that this uh, is working with uh, the kindergarten and our food cooperative and so on and the idea is if then they would do it with the people that is around them they would use the same technology that then we can really kind of create this federated network with this knowledge and information. It doesn't have to happen only on the local level, but we can replicate this at the global level. So it's a different scale of the fractal and there will be similar uh, things, but also uh, differences because for instance, it doesn't make sense to know that you need an egg uh, from uh, to let that uh, known to the other side of the world. So that's why we created this uh, um, social new social economic grid um, be, uh, during the World Wide Web. And the idea is that we having a, uh, a map that is a fractal. So the, these are hexagon within hexagons. And this hexagon communicate uh, through the Holonic Earth operating system. And you can imagine it as an information system for the planet that where we can just leave information that is needed in not in a very different way than maybe hands leave messages so then other hands can pick up the message and can coordinate. So it's a sort of like a human stigmatic system. And uh, the idea is that if we look at the hexagon as the base Three of the minutes, fraud, Roberto. Thanks. We can actually create services that are then working on the, um, on the hexagon level, but at the same time they can work at the um, they can communicate to the nearby hexagons, but also maybe move up or down into the fractal scale. So since this could also be used for uh, governance systems, so we can actually just have geospatial sociocratic, uh, sociocratic governance. But since we are short in time, I'm just going to jump into a short demonstration. Um, so here is the, here's the map. So the holosphere, um, and here we can actually select the land. So what are we looking at? So right now we're looking at hubs, and you can see that there are two hubs here indicated. You can zoom in, and you can see where these hubs are. Um, and then down here, you can actually have a list of tasks that are happening into that level of the fractal. And uh, here you can see. Uh, we can actually put down a new task. Uh, so. And this appears here immediately. And, uh, and see, it's, uh, it's real time reacting. And uh, what we can do is also say, uh, we can actually publish this into this message into the uh, into the map but even better we can cast and we can give it a lens so now if i type the lens limit on here you see that something has popped up so his hello limicon 
So I can actually zoom in and actually see, oh, it actually came from here, this flare, and it actually came from here, and so on, all the way down to the place where it actually came from. And you can see here, this is just kind of like an hello world kind of example, but you can imagine how uh, maybe a, a cast for a need can actually be annihilated by a cast from an offer nearby at a certain level. So only, only information that is relevant is actually surfacing. So only information that is not satisfied. Um, yeah, I think this is a, a, a yeah, nice, um, I think I'm running out of, money, of uh, time. So I'm just... Out of money, out of time, time is money, is time. <laughs> Thank you, Roberto. Okay, next up is Rishi, who is going to share some stories about his time in Uganda recently at a gathering of indigenous leaders. Over to you, Rishi. Hey, guys. Um, I know we've been talking tech for a while. Um, this is not going to be tech. This is going to be, well, who's going to use the tech? And if we take a look around at the space right now, we've got a lot of men. I'm not really sure if there's any females around. And therein lies the problem. Hey, we've got one woman. It's brilliant. Thank you. And, you know, it ends up like this, where like most of our spaces are, it's, it's mostly the men. And not that there's anything wrong with that. The men definitely create the, the tools and the space required for this to happen. Lena, would you like to speak something? Cool. So um, I'll do a screen share and show you what was happening at the event. And the context of how this happened was a friend of ours, Day, a player of the World Wide Web, um, was commuting with these um, folks called the Indigenous Commons who would like to see a change in the world where the Indigenous get to decide or with their wisdom can essentially tell people what is the best way to live life instead of us approaching with um, without the thousands of years of Indigenous wisdom as to how to live locally humanity really where human life would have originated and Along came 12 indigenous guardians. And there, um, the space held by our Buddhist monk, Bhante Buddha at the first um, Buddhist temple in all of Africa, we held circles. We held communes with each other. Um, and I guess one of the biggest lessons I took away from it was the power of respecting boundaries and sacred practices. And the story goes like this. So we had a friend of ours who came in from the Native American group of people. He was a member of the Nipmuc tribe. And he was wearing a shirt that said sobriety is sacred. And he believes in that. Yet we were holding a circle for another brother of ours from South America, representing his tribe. And he bought along a tobacco leaf for his ceremony. And we chopped up the tobacco leaves, squeezed out the tobacco in it into a bowl. And we were taking that into our hands, holding a circle, keeping out the bad spirits out and snorting that, right? And in came our brother Andre as well, wearing the shirt saying sobriety is sacred. And understanding that within the circle, taking the tobacco and communing with the spirits is what is sacred. And so he does that and he has deep visions. Um, the facilitator essentially feels his body, gets him to pull out all of the toxins that he's been accumulating. And that created a tremendous amount of spirit there and that spirit came from recognizing the boundary that we have created and what is sacred within that boundary and communing like that 
creates tremendous amounts of spiritual abundance, which is what we're looking for in this day and age. We need to be able to, well, um, first heal from the, the little fixations of egos that we make and things like that. And that means communing with your ancestral spirits. Another technology or spiritual technology that I can kind of also call upon is um, the difference between the masculine and the feminine polarities and what it takes to hold space for the masculine and what it takes to hold space for the feminine. And if non-duality is of any use as a lens, it acknowledges the duality between things, but also says, hey, we need to move past that and integrate the dualities. And one of the questions that, um, or one of the good health indicators was a woman amongst us saying that she feels like she can trust men again, which that is a crucial thing. And without a male and the female being reconciled by a sacred that can hold the goodness of the male and the female, we can't really trust each other. We can't create dances or create or generate anything. And most of our ecosystems, if they can't handle the masculine and the feminine polarities and hold the, hold the sacredness for the masculine and the feminine to be in relation, we won't be able to create any value, but we might be able to capture some value as is tradition with our systems of capital. And so if we have to move to a more generative place, the sacred becomes very important. And something we at the World Wide Web hold very strongly is the container of the sacredness. And to make sure that we are spiritually elevated to work together in fixing these problems, right? So if that means the different puzzle pieces that integrate into the into the World Wide Web technology stack, how do you create trust with people who have, I mean, giant egos for good reason, right? We need egos to defend our ideas and things like that. We have giant egos for those reasons. We also have the capacity to collaborate and work. But how do we know we don't get um, um, the short stick or the, you know, our value gets captured away by someone else, right? And what does it take in terms of spiritual elevation so that we can actually trust together and work together in order to make something happen? And I think, yeah, I mean, the wisdom traditions need to be looked at. You can't just create tech um, and then say it's going to save the world unless um, it's uh, save the people that's working on it. So that's that's my five minutes, I guess. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Rishi. You actually have another two minutes because you had 10 minutes total. So if you wish to add something more, then please do. And if not, we'll move on. I can open the stage for anybody else that's got something to say. We're now going to be moving over to Jacob, who will share with us about public sphere technologies. If you want to add something as an intro, you have one and a half minutes. Oh, sorry, did I miss what Chris said? What, sorry? Yeah, if anyone would like to kind of like step in, but I, I think we let's uh, move on to Jacob. Jacob, please take the floor. That's okay, I'm, I'm still setting up. With you, anybody, ah, share screen, all right. All right, let's see what we got. Uh, can people see what's going on? Yep. Let's go to, redo the, the thing. All right, anyways. Ah, here we go. All right, um, so I'll be presenting on P alpha. Uh, the idea is that uh, P is a collectively defined uh, group, uh, you know, individual P's as lowercase p, um, the total collective of all people is the uppercase P. We're all searching for some kind of individually defined alpha. And the idea here is to collectively define a capital P alpha. Um, this is a symbolic way. We'll be uh, going about this, um, taking some theoretical approaches to look at what sort of um, structures uh, must exist in order for 
this type of P alpha to be able to naturally emerge at large scales. We'll be looking at some natural principles, going on to some modern day status quo of uh, the political infrastructure that exists, and looking at some tools that we love that currently exist in, um, you know, off the shelf that we can leverage in order to create uh, the necessary infrastructure to support a collectively defined alpha. Uh, so I come from the brain science community. I've been looking at uh, network properties and um, scaling systems, fractal systems for quite some time. It's really interesting when you look at brain activity, how um, the magnitude, the power density of the signal uh, varies over the course of the frequency of the activity. Um, each neural impulse is about, uh, you know, a thousand, a thousand hertz. Uh, so you're getting these high frequency frequency neural impulses that collectively work together to create very large power um, amplitude shifts in the low frequency range. So that tells us that um, in natural systems that are creating some kind of uh, information rich, um, you know, expression, um, all of the various parts of the system are working together to create some um, large scale, low frequency um, resonance. Um, you can see this over very long periods of time as being the sense of self over very short periods of time as being the sense of awakeness or drowsiness. And at higher frequencies, you get the impulse of uh, new information um, incident on, on the sensory system. And then you attune to that and reorient your lower frequency um, brain rhythms to attune to this, this momentary um, uh, impulse. You can see this also in physical structures. So at the, on the left-hand side, we have Brownian motion, and this is just thermal motion that happens with every particle. Um, the, the, a particle will move around in a space um, seemingly at random, but over time, it will tend to migrate um, around over large scales. So what we're seeing with even physical systems is that these same properties of small changes creating large-scale structures um, are found there. And this is actually what nature is doing to create larger scale structures. We see this in, in the cellular systems as well, where incremental additions of individual cells um, bifurcate out into a fractal pattern that covers more space. So what we're seeing is that um, when we create structure, we're using these natural processes of exploration seemingly randomly and in embodying that into these long memory processes where cells are incrementally added in not the Brownian sense, but more in the signal processing sense um, as information collects here structurally in the forms of new cells adding one on top of the other, you create a branching pattern uh, that richly um, interacts with the, the energy around it. In this case, the sun and the water. So what we want in order to create a, a strong social political system, uh, because these things that are, you know, both neuronal, both part uh, physical, also biological, also have an expression in social systems. We want a system that has long memory. Think about it like this. You know, if somebody's saying something into the air, you know, I do or I will buy or whatever kind of social um, speech act um, people are trying to make you want there to be a memory of that so that other people can make use of these speech acts. Absent that, we're just, you know, essentially shouting in this cacophony and nothing makes sense. There's no memory for it. So in addition to the long memory processes, we want the capacity for there to be um, long range connectivity across, across participants. And th this long range connectivity has to have particular properties. Otherwise we break down into what we have today, the status quo of there being only a few long range connections. Now what happens at that point in these dashed lines that you see, the dashed lines that form a triangle have actually formed their own group. And this is similar to things like, you know, you and the blue, your community, you're naturally talking with each other, you're your tribe, you elect the, the black diamond to go to Congress, they, they talk with the other black diamonds, and you know, you get the issue of Congress falling apart and not representing the will of the people. There's this bottleneck of information because the network is utilizing only a few long range connections in order to interact with the whole of the of all of the parts. 
So as an alternative to that, we need a system that has inexpensive long range connections where everybody has a, an even op opportunity to connect into this public sphere and present this information that's going to have a long memory. Now it's really great that we're moving in this way towards web three, because a lot of the problems that uh, we saw in web one where information is only one directional and also in web two are really satisfied in this web three case because you know, in Web3, we're focusing on the content itself and not necessarily where it's or, or who's serving that content. We're also allowing for people to have this bi-directional interaction between a system that has this long memory. So it seems as though we've solved much of these early problems with um, sustainable, large-scale social political structures with Web3. But, you know, we've still got this DAO governance problem. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, when people are trying to form these wisdom collectives, the conversation breaks down. Now, why is that? One of the issues is that we don't have a detailed conversation occurring, that even though people will make statements into, you know, the, the Web3 sphere, it's, it's located on blockchain, you know, whatever, it's not really interpretable. And one of the things that we might want to do then is to have collective knowledge um, be present within this um, this public sphere as a detailed and symbolic communication system. So let's say P1 and P3 are in some kind of coordination with one another. Let's say they, they're trying to trust each other, um, but there's this relationship, uh, this intermediate relationship with P2. P2's interaction can maybe catalyze the, the movement of, of goods or services or trust, you know, natural trust between P1 and P3. If P2 decides to add in their particular statements to this collective knowledge graph. And as we move um, from this, this simple case to very large structures, it becomes clear that we've, we've captured collective knowledge in some database that is both machine interpretable and human interpretable. We've created a complete discourse and that allows for us to um, leverage the silver bullet that is AI to interpret this very large knowledge graph towards creating collective wisdom. And I think it's really amazing that we're sitting at this time talking about this concept. Everybody's bringing together, you know, their um, their puzzle pieces, and they can all fit together. It's really amazing. We've got Web three. We've got knowledge graphs as a as a as a um, as a meme that everybody seems to have communicated throughout throughout this set of presentations. And should we apply um, the latest technology of artificial intelligence? which is very good at reading both knowledge graphs and also talking with people about what's in the knowledge graph, we can start to have a really easy way of interpreting very massive databases of shared knowledge and utilizing some of these other um, user interfaces uh, to act on this, uh, this stable database of knowledge to create um, you know, cooperative agreements among subgroups and perhaps even create a cooperative agreement at the scale of all people. I'd be very interested to see what happens uh, when we start to talk about, um, you know, core values. We reach everybody, everybody can, you know, assert their core value into this knowledge graph. And perhaps there's some distillate that exists at the scale of all people where everybody says, ah, yes, I point to this, this core value and I say, yeah, I agree with that. At, Three minutes, the Jacob. at the subscale, thank you, Lawrence. At the subscale, we can talk to, talk about other things like where do you want to go for lunch, you know? And some things, uh, you know, that are only uh, relevant to people at this local scale. So I'm very interested uh, with what can be done leveraging um, neuro, what's called neural symbolic AI with these databasing systems that leverage Web3 to create the information space uh, that's usable toward with other interfaces towards obtaining collective wisdom, collective intelligence, and um, and shared values, really. Uh, so, thank you for thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jacob. Now over to Brad and James.
to talk about the database approaches, the tech stack, and the plugin system of this new substrate that we are growing at the World Wide Web. Uh, James, maybe I'll start, and then you can uh, talk about the mapping the system. So I can I can hear you, Brad. Um, I'll just start with a bit about the um, database stuff. So, as as Jacob was pointing to there, you know, we've this this network of people in the World Wide Web. We've we've all been working on different pieces, puzzle pieces, different bits of technology, and so we've been having a lot of conversations about how we can actually start fitting these pieces together uh, to generate a stack that we can then build on and really start experimenting with all these visions and ideas we have. Um, so just briefly before Brad gets into the, the current stack that we're envisioning, um, I just wanted to point to some of the kinds of things we've been discussing. So here, this is, these are just some basic kind of diagrams that are kind of looking at different approaches to building applications. Um, so the first image here is just meant, meant to represent the kind of the standard Web2 approach where you have siloed applications. And when you build a community, it's very much just coupled to that application and there's very little communication with other apps. Uh, another possible approach here is this kind of permeable networked apps. So it's still very much a kind of a web two approach, but there's communication happening between the apps. And so this is where if you have a kind of a shared protocol, there could be the option to export data from one app, import it into another, or have, you know, automated um, requests and signals being sent between the apps. So for example, you post something in one app and it automatically then gets posted to the others. Uh, so that, you know, enables a little bit more communication, but it also comes with other trade-offs. Um, and then this is a kind of a, a slightly different approach that we've sometimes been referring to as a data commons. So this, the idea here is that instead of having the data coupled to an application, the data actually exists separate from applications and applications become windows into this kind of data pool. So this is meant to visualize a centralized data commons. So you could imagine a big database that's holding lots of different communities data. And then those applications are like windows looking into that. Um, another approach would be a more decentralized approach. So rather than having everything in one database, you might have lots of different databases um, and applications can look into those. Uh, and you, you kind of solve the problem of having all the data and power concentrated in one place. But the downside then is you um, searching across different uh, databases, the queries can actually become quite complex and time consuming. Uh, and so this is a, a third approach that I'm quite keen on, which is a kind of a hybrid centralized and decentralized data commons where certain bits of data uh, are stored globally so that you can do very fast global queries that look across all the different databases uh, in the network but then as much data as possible is decentralized. So you're, it's trying to get this balance of enabling fast global queries, but also giving users as much control and, and sovereignty over their own data and their community's data. Um, and there's a few other little diagrams here down here that are also kind of trying to visualize this, but uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share a link to, the, um, to this post so people can read a bit more about it. Um, and Brad, do you wanna uh, start on the, the tech stack? Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm part, besides World Wide Web, I'm, all, I'm part of one, at least one other group that has this vision of raising money for a whole ecosystem of um, approaches and technologies and, and uh, applications. And it's frustrating because we have no money, right? And uh, a lot of this work is getting done just by people doing it in the time that they can set aside. But we, sh but the, the vision is huge, right? And uh, it should be um, really well funded. And I think for me, part of the, the one of the requirements for getting funded is just to really be able to tell the, the story in a, in a very precise way. I mean, if, you, if we think of ourselves as a, as a startup, we're trying to get angel funding or, or first, uh, first round financing uh, no funder is going to give it to us just because we're a you know a friendly ecosystem with with a vision. We're, they're going to want to know what is what are we going to do? What are, what what are our deliverables? What's our what is our technical uh, 
differentiator, et cetera. So I, I'll share this uh, stack that we've been working on, but I'll also do a screen share here if I can find a way back to, uh, there we go. Um, so I'll just walk you through, there's videos on that link that kind of explain uh, the, the, the basics on it. Um, but so uh, the idea on the stack is that any one of these things is uh, implementation independent. So in the same way that uh, the internet uh, stack has a transport layer, it doesn't care whether it's Wi-Fi or ethernet or fiber or whatever. It's just, it, as long as it does the job of taking an input and processing an output, <coughs> uh, according to the spec, then it's, they're, they're interchangeable. So that's the idea here. Starting at the bottom, uh, the identity layer, uh, we, won't, we don't need to go into too much detail here, but the identity layer needs to have proof of, proof of uniqueness, proof of personhood. Uh, and then above that, then you get to the personal layer, which is uh, assumed to be uh, self-sovereign in the sense that I own my own data and uh, what we're calling pods, personal online data stores. However, we implement them, whether they're centralized or decentralized, uh, I've kind of broken it down into two kinds of marking um, as, a, as, a, as the primary um, approaches to personal data. I mark people and I mark content. Uh, and then moving up a layer to community level, a community is basically a, the union of a bunch of pods. Um, and so I can, opt, I can opt into a community by agreeing to share some or all of my personal data with that community and no one else. That community, the, the, people, the people edges that I share form this social substrate. So the community has, has the union of our, my, my edges and your edges, and that's a social graph. And they can be, they can be aggregated and federated to very large, um, <clears throat> very large um, you know, elements. And then they have community resources like, tre like treasuries. Okay, so that's the kind of, so that could be small or very, very large. This is, this is the vision around the regenerative movement as a, as a, as a uh, global network co-op. It could be million, millions or hundreds of millions of people. And then the idea is that the app ecosystem, as I mentioned in my, my first talk, um, can leverage this, you know, basically an app becomes something that a, a community can opt into and say, yes, we want to use that that governance mechanism or that financial resource allocation system or this messaging system or sense making tool um and then the, so and then what is that app ecosystem i haven't we haven't done a lot of detail here but it just kind of gives you the idea that you would have plugins that make development of new apps easy um by having by providing access to users or governance or you know core functionality and then and then apps can be built on top of that um so anyway th th so this something like this then becomes something we can go to funders and say this is really what we're doing here's all the components that are in, are in process here's how here's use of funds to where that's going to go in terms of of uh you know complete completing implementation of each of these layers. Brandon, we're very tight for time. So can your, uh, can it wait until the Q and A? Sure. Indeed, I just wanted to signal that. Cool. Thank you. Um, James, you have a few minutes if you want to add something to that. Uh, I was thinking that leads quite nicely into the app ecosystem. So if, if you wanted to start on that, Lawrence, maybe, and then I can add more, or, or I'm happy to go into it. Um, please, please begin, uh, because I'm going to try and be really quick at the end, because we're already a little bit over time. And um, so I'm going to try and condense more what I have to say at the end, but I'm going to need to really get to the flow and then wrap it up at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the idea with the... Um, what we're calling the seed app is would it would be the first application that we build on this stack. And as Brad was kind of touching on, we we really want it to be a very modular framework. So it would have you know enough of the kind of functionality to to enable the creation of of communities and to build these kind of knowledge graphs between people. 
um, but it'd be set up with this plugin marketplace in mind. And that would enable people to develop modular components that could then be kind of mixed and matched to build communities. Uh, and we could set up some really interesting incentives to grow that plugin marketplace. Uh, so for example, you know, what, one idea we had is a kind of like a, a vision marketplace. So people who are not developers could actually put forward ideas for tools and features that they would like, and then other people can vote on those ideas. They could add, they could tip them and, and actually start to generate a kind of crowdsource bounty reward for the development of those features. And then developers could come in and they could either work on their own ideas or they could see what's being requested by the larger network. Uh, and then be rewarded uh, for creating those tools. Um, and this, so this could include tools for communities. It could also include general post types. So it could, that could be things like games, different decision-making tools. Uh, and then another aspect that we're really keen on is um, UI-based plugins. So the ability to have different templates for viewing content and different themes so people can really style their communities and personalize their own experience. Um, so those are the kind of the, the principles that we feel will, will actually enable us to evolve this system um, as, 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 as fast uh, and as well as possible without it being like a small team that are doing everything, but it's really open to other developers to contribute to. Um, and in terms of the very first functionality that we want for the seed app, what we're thinking at the moment, and this is something we, we're open to other people's feedback on, but starting with um, the social graph that Brad has been working on. So this ability to kind of create edges between people where you can praise people based on different metrics. Um, you can indicate, you know, who's had interactions. So it's possible to see within a network who's actually been communicating and who's, who, who's participating and who's more on the edge. Um, and then with that social graph, then tying that in with some basic decision making tools. So starting with some very simple polls, but then also adding more complex things like decision trees, which tie together uh, connected polls um, and al allowing people not just to vote in a kind of a one person, one vote system, but actually tap into that social graph and weight the decisions based on the expertise required for those decisions. So if it's a technical decision that needs to be made as part of a decision tree. Um, you know, we could weight that towards people who have, you know, we collectively trust and have experience and expertise in, say, back end uh, technology. Um, so that's the kind of the basic idea. And then from there, we then want to expand to add all kinds of other functionality. Um, but that's the, the seed idea. Thank you very much, James. I will now expand shortly on some of those ideas, keeping it sharp presentation about the wisdom web, this seed app towards a wiser world web. And the aim of the seed app is that together we create the technology that we need to organize ourselves to create the technology that everybody needs. So how do we serve the wider regenerative liminal movement that, that we can develop the tools and the toys which they need to flourish. The goal of the World Wise Web is cultivating this right relationship between part and whole that both may evolve, or better said, make the parts party and the wholes holy. How do we do that? We are going to need all of the various elements of our society and recreate them with this spirit of wisdom in mind. Here is a triad, one of many, culture, governance, and economics. I'm gonna run you through one dimension that we're placing into the seed app from each of these domains. So to begin, the culture. And we decide to begin with the culture. We think that, that the culture comes first. The propolis, which is the glue that bees use to stick the hive together. Here, the propolis is the social glue. It is the relationships which hold us together. And in the seed app, how that looks like, it is the interaction and the expertise graph.
So the interaction graph, the interaction graph allows us to record the number, the length, and the type of interactions in between the members of the web. That includes one-on-ones, that includes small groups, that includes the regular meetings, the Tuesdays and the Thursdays. And for example, in the type of interactions, we can tag the wisdom practices that people have done. And here there is a link to another pre presentation, which is on the proof of wisdom, which describes some more of the ways that we've been thinking about how can people show that they've been participating in minimum viable wisdom practices, and we can then represent them on the graph and uh, see if that has some kind of impact on the way that the that people are behaving within the whole. Here is a visualization of uh, the social graph. And you can see that there are many different lines. Some of them are dotted, which shows weak links. Some of them are thicker, and they would mean people who have met more often. And then some of them are thicker still. And in this way, we can represent the intensity of connection in between people. And you can imagine that you would be able to filter this across many different metrics. So for example, how often have people met or for how long have people met or what, who have been participating in a specific type of wisdom practice. And then there is the expertise graph. And this allows us to praise each other's expertise in specific domains. We can then record the interaction proof on the edges of the graph. For example, if I participate in a one-on-one -on, -one on somebody, I can record the conversation, place it onto the connection in between the two people, add the transcript, and then as I browse the graph, I can see the record of the interaction. And on my node, I can offer a portfolio to the world that shows my expertise. And then people can come, look through my portfolio, and already praise my expertise based off on that without having to have a direct interaction with me. Now, Ecopolis, the governance, the decision graph. With the social graph that we've cultivated in the Propolis, we can weight decision making with a domain specific expertise score and a web wise interaction score. So the expertise score allows us to delegate voting weight to people who have proven their expertise, their expertise has been evaluated by the web as a whole, and they have more weight within the specific domain. But then there's also a web Y score, and the web Y score is cultivated by the amount and the intensity of interactions that you've had within the web. And why is that significant? That is significant because through the number and intensity of interactions that you've had, you are then holding more context. You are holding a collective context which people who haven't been interacting as much within the web will not have. And that is a web-wide score that affects the weight of all of your decisions within the web. Here there's a representation of this decision graph and how on the, the black spot is a specific domain, uh, which can then affect subdomains. So depending on the expertise which you have within that specific domain, you will then be given weight over all of the uh, branches which continue down uh, below there. I'd love to be able to give James some more time to speak about this specific point. Unfortunately, we don't have time to speak about that today, but uh, please join one of the calls or reach out to one of us and we'll gladly go that further in depth. Finally, 
Ecosophy, the economics. With this social graph and with the decision tree, with the decision graph, we can then start to collectively decide how do we want to govern this growth pattern of this seed? Uh, how, what are the next branches which we need to develop, which we need to cultivate, which are best going to serve ourselves and the wider web? And here are a few examples of the economics that we've been thinking about. Mutual credit graphs, using time credits to create alternative currencies that allow us to organize ourselves and to get shit done during a period when we don't have access to funds. Financial irrigation that Brad has a lot of interesting ideas about, about how do we define domains of expertise and allow those people to decide where the funds should flow to down this real trickle down economics and matronage and patronage an idea that Rishi has a lot to say about, about how do we balance out uh, a way that people can be held in the matronage by a universal basic income and encouraged and incentivized into hierarchies through the patronage to get shit done and to reach for their best. So that's all on my side. And that's all from us at the World Wise Web. Thank you very much for joining and for sharing your attention. We can now at last open the floor to conversation and question and answers. Please raise your hand if you have something to say. And here we go, Brandon, over to you. Yes, thank you. And uh, I, I'd actually like to, to join more of these uh, calls going forward. I, I, I wasn't able to join before, but uh, there are certain things that I might be able to offer. And I just wanted to kind of mention some of that here is the uh, connection to uh, core meta theory and uh, arch theory. And I'm not sure. I, I think there was some mention of uh, implicit mention of that uh, here. Um, and like, for example, the atom layer is uh, based on a certain meta theory, but that's uh, that there are certain core patterns that allow for the optimization of storing data, transferring data, and um, you know networking and uh, things like that. So that's really uh, useful and important. And I have some connections to the Arch Disciplinary Research Center and uh, to the uh, Institute of Applied Meta Theory, and so we could probably bring that in. Also, there are certain, uh, some applications. You guys touched on a few of these applications. Um, there, there are some that uh, I'm, I'm aware of that uh, also have potential to build in some revenue streams. Uh, like, you know, that I'm not sure what kind of uh, patterns or I'm sorry, um, revenue uh, generation you guys are comfortable with, or like the freemium model. I'm aware of uh, some people who are building some uh, some tools that have a certain kind of freemium model that could be built on top of, uh, you know, Wico and Hilo, et cetera, uh, you know, and utilizing this tech stack, wherein uh, perhaps a percent of that, uh, you know, um, subscription fees or whatever it happens to be could then be uh, transferred back to the uh, lower in the stack, you know, those technologies. So that's, that's I think, a good way. And if you have a, a credible plan for this, then that could actually help uh, bring in some seed funding. So um, I'm aware of some people who are already, already looking at the uh, quantification of impact and the uh, the so-called TAM, SAM, SOM. You might have heard of that as the total addressable market and stuff like that. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, stuff uh, we can get into more later um if anybody wants to to talk to me or i'll join you know these further meetings if i'm aware of what time they are <laughs> going forward thank you thank you brandon over to you steve yeah, double click on the mute button yeah all right um yeah, non-responsive interfaces that don't respond to user input immediately is one of my big pet peeves. Um, I think this piece of software we're using right now is an utter piece of garbage. Um, I think one of the first things that I'd like to see, obviously, is better uh, real-time collaboration tools. Um, I can get into async design another time, but I was put in the mind by this by the whole glass bead thing. So 
I want to generalize it into this type of tool by just dividing up everybody's time to talk, talk time, essentially. Everyone has like a little life bar beneath them, which shows how much time they have left to talk. And you can interrupt other people. It just uses your talk time 10 times as fast. So go right ahead. Um, so the idea is that you can also, if you like what someone says, you can give the talk time that they have to someone else to hear more from them. Like here's some, some my talk time to answer the question I'm asking you. Buddha boom. So it's this, anyway, it's just one feature for sync that I could discuss with you guys. So anyway, good stuff. That sounds interesting to me, Steve, and um, especially the real-time collaboration stuff. And uh, we're hoping essentially to use the tech stack to be able to share the data comments, to share an identity layer, and to share the graph layers, and then to definitely innovate on ideas such as this. I mean, Lawrence is definitely working on Castilia, which is supposed to be glass bead games, uh, multiplayer, and then building out a map using that. So I think you will be yeah, interested in the tech stack once it's ready to go. Yeah, that's a great idea, Steve. And I recommend that you have a look at the link, which I posted a little bit higher up. I'll find it and I'll post it again, which is Nick Redmark's latest work. I already opened it, but I haven't. You already it. opened it. You okay, great. It, you know, there was other stuff, so I haven't looked at it. Yeah, so, so that that is moving towards a generalization as you're describing and it wouldn't take much more to integrate some of the features which you just described Am I supposed to say I'm done or something? <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's just enjoying a moment of silence after information overload. Um, did, did anybody want to, uh, among the organizers, uh, uh, reflect on or offer some thoughts on, on what I was saying uh, a moment ago about the connection to arch theory uh, or meta theory um, or revenue streams, either of those? Um, I'll, yeah, I'll talk about that. I mean, I think the when I talk about the network cooperative, um, I, I kind of I see it as um, essentially this social substrate where any any community is a slice of that social substrate. So World Wide Web would be a small sub network of this larger thing. And if it's a it, and the, the theory is that any large social graph is worth a lot of money, right? So how do you take something that's cooperatively owned and, and um, you know, not made to be exploited in every possible way, but still capture the value of it? Uh, and then how do you distribute that value in a way that any uh, subnetwork, you know, can be innovative and entrepreneurial and generate value, but that it and capture that value, but also share some of it with the whole. Um, so I think that's a just a general question um, about how you go from. Um, sorry, let me turn the beeping off. Um, how you go from a uh, sort of standard cooperative bylaws, which are very much just oriented around what a board decides and what what members right have rights. Um, if, if, if it's a fractal sub, it's a fractal, you know, network of networks, then what's the governance that kind of moves the, the nutrients around in a, uh, in a predictable, in a, in a deterministic way. I think it's not, it's a non-trivial problem, but definitely, uh, the tools are there to kind of let emergent solutions arise. So yeah, Brandon, I think that'd be a good long, longer term question. Um, about how to um, kind of uh, imbue governance um, documentation to be supportive of evolution. 
Charles here, I'll just jump in to tag on there and that, yeah, I'm also very involved in this uh, network autonomous organism or network cooperative concept, which is essentially platform cooperative um, through the lens of the network. <clears throat> it can also be a DAO, you know, network based DAO concept. And really to put in other terms, Brad, what you just said, you know, to, to really zoom in and identify together collective attention, cat herding to identify mm -hmm. the stakeholders and to see wh what are those relationships between the stakeholders. There's a lot of work, there's a lot of good work done around value flows too, which I think those people could bring a lot to this. Sorry, was that you yeah. next? Yeah, yeah, so and I just wanted to speak to Brandon's point there of um, the architecture side of things and also the revenue stream. So on the architecture side of things, this is something we've kind of like deeply thought about, especially when it comes to like integrating Adam. Like James and I have had this conversation of Hey, if everything is kind of like decentralized and things like that, we are going to have a hard problem when it comes to like things like search, right? Where if it's not all indexed in one place, how do we actually search something effectively? How do we store the distributed tables of where things are stored and things like that? And at, the, at this point, we are not really sure how you can optimize for things like this. We haven't done our research on that side of things. But where we feel comfortable is to create something that we would like to call the open data commons. So that's a common centralized pool where we can like store data, make it accessible via Adam, and use a social DNA on Adam to essentially set the rules of who gets to modify the um, database and things like that. So that problem still remains. What kind of architecture or what kind of like semi-digesting can you do to then pass it on to another digester if that makes sense from that whole um, metaphor. Julie, could you mute? I'll just mute you. Yeah, okay. So, on, on, and also the funding side of things, um, I can't speak for the entire team yet, but uh, I like the idea of what you were saying about like impact certificates and things like that. and. As I see it, we are creating an ecosystem here, an ecosystem for innovators to essentially work on. We are using the centralized, or we're using the seed app and our tech stack as a crystallization point for a lot of people to like build and innovate and figure out what kind of patterns, UX patterns and things like that work um, for collective wisdom aggregation and you know application. And impact certificates seem really useful. Um, I guess at this point in terms of funding, what we can offer is credits for funders. And I personally think the money for these innovation networks or people who are essentially trying to solve the meta crisis must come from the people who have go gotten a lot from meta crisis, at least from like a moral place. So giving them high quality impact certificates and making sure that the ecosystem stays alive so that the story, you know, anybody can make an impact certificate. But for the impact of the impact certificate to really hold, you want to make sure that the story holds. So that's something that we want to really work on. Because right now we're working on the tech and the processes, but what is really going to keep things alive is content. So how do we move to creating good content that keeps the story alive is definitely the question and the funding as I see it. But there's, of course, funding, you know, business mechanisms, good businesses that you can, wise businesses that you can create with the tech stack and the products um, that we make here. You muted, Brad. You're still muted, Brad. Yeah, I'm really bullish on the idea of a crowdfunding campaign that's tied to a, a cooperative membership uh, outreach. So basically, you 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 offer people and you you invite people to participate, and the invitation is important because that creates high degrees of trust within it. And um, and you invite them to be members, and in order to be a member, you pay fifty dollars ahead of time uh, for dues ahead, you know, for five years of dues or whatever. And uh, it doesn't even have to exist yet. Part of the use of funds would be to, to actually manifest it as a legal entity. But I, but, uh, I do think that there's, there's a good story here that should be able to reach a few thousand people and get some working capital and then work in various in horizons of like 100,000, a million, 10 million.
Uh, can, can someone say how, uh, how how we find out about when the, the future uh, worldwide wise web meetings are? Those are posted somewhere, I suppose. Then the calendar. Yeah, I put a, in the chat there, Brandon. Yeah. You can see the the information. Well, Lawrence, if you want to add to that at all. No, no, I didn't want to add to that. I was just going to signal that there was that in the chat. Jacob, did you want to say something? Yeah, just talking about revenue models and um, initial use cases. Um, certainly, there are all the DAO communities that um, you know, have need for um, a collective wisdom um, application. I think we've got um, some tools already available that can serve um, those needs, or within a short period of time. Um, but you know, going going beyond that, um, I, I'm interested as to whether or not the community believes we're at a position where we can start thinking about things like running political campaigns. Like let's, let's think about a, an alternative to polling um, that has as its foundation, a green check um, where people know, all right, you know, you would support this candidate. And so in places where um, we have a first past the post style voting, even at the local level, it would be possible to determine in advance whether voting for an out of party candidate uh, would exceed the the boundary needed to elect this person into office. At that point, um, you know, even at the local level, at that point, gaining incremental traction uh, through existing governance structures uh, would be a means to both fund and, um, you know, project the use case uh, for these types of technologies. Eventually, we'll have to get to that point of interacting with existing um, political economies. Um, and I think the most easy, you know, it's easier to address the political side of things since that's purely social as than it is to address the economic side, which I think has also um, the potential for revenue generation. Thank you, Jacob. There are three minutes left. Feel free to stick around and continue the conversation if you have time. Before we wrap things up, I'd like to extend an invitation to people who are interested in joining the World Wide Web. There, there is a, a membrane around the World Wide Web which requires the uh, a willingness to join regularly the meetings which are on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 to 6 p.m. CET. That doesn't mean joining every meeting, but a willingness to show up when you can. And then more importantly to or equally importantly, sorry, to participate in one-on-ones with other members of the web. And there is a minimum requirement to do three one-on-ones with people before really joining. And that gives us a minimum way of judging, do you fit the vibe or not? My sense is, is that everybody who has joined here today will likely fit the vibe from the interest that you've shown. If you're interested in joining, then please feel free to reach out to me on my email or on Telegram, and I can add you to uh, one of our groups, and then you can start conversing with some of the other members, and and um, and then we can play together over these next three months that we've got left until the end. So as said, it's a six month process with the aim that at the end, we've built a functioning prototype that we can seriously use to coordinate ourselves to organize what we want to do. And then to be able to plug in to the wider webs, which are around us and to, to grow and serve the wider community. 
Rishi, you would like to do a dry run on the pitch deck wire frame? Yeah, I mean, that's fine with me. There is one more minute if anybody else has a quick question or something which they would like to add. Just want to thank you, Lawrence, for spearheading all of this. Lawrence and James of WICO in particular have been uh, holding space and, and, and prodding us along this play along. So uh, kudos. In that case, Rishi, over to you. Hey guys, um, thank you. So this is a pitch deck. At least we are working out the rhythm of or the flow of the conversation. A lot of the words are to be changed. A lot of things are, a lot of diagrams have to be put in and things like that. But this is generally the rhythm or of the narrative. And here it goes. I'll do a screen share and. Can you see the screen? Yes. So we're starting with the meta crisis and the meta crisis cannot, um, we can all explain it in so many different ways, but where you see the meta crisis is in its, you know, thousand faces that we actually get to interact with and see how broken and twisted they are. The ability of us to like name the word meta crisis to see the meta problem that's causing all of these um, issues that we're being drowned with has given us, you know, a lot of courage. And this courage has led to the creation of like many puzzle pieces for solving the meta crisis. Hey, I can tackle that face of the meta crisis with this solution. I can solve that with this solution and things like that. But the attractor of the meta crisis has not really done its job in terms of creating the meta solution yet, at least. So some of these we've discussed in the presentation, I mean, in our presentations today. And one of the first points is a lot of important discussion, but not deliverable solutions, right? A lot of the courage brings a lot of people together and gets them talking, but nothing happens. Next, we have people who then figure out, hey, what are the right puzzle pieces, form the right corporations, you know, right um, legal structures, uh, governance structures and uh, technologies in order to make things happen. But in that hurry, they end up creating puzzle pieces that are not really made to be interoperable with another puzzle piece for tackling the faces of the meta crisis, the beast of the meta crisis. And of course, what we've also seen is the lack of adoption and the catalysis of like real network effect against fighting this um, big bad of the meta crisis. And one of the main reasons we can't really do this with our, you know, VC framework or um, startup frameworks is because the market really doesn't know how you can um, make returns or get something out of investing or funding into um, interoperability, real interoperability, where um, your all your puzzle pieces are open source for anybody to work with, then what's in it for me as an investor to invest my hard earned or whatever, however earned money into. And of course, the broken market sense making that is really um, at the core of the meta crisis. But we must find a way to bring the puzzle pieces into a holistic picture and Doing this requires us to maintain the courage, trust, and love for these innovators to work together. And this is our proposal for why the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is an ecosystem for innovators to out-coordinate the market by crafting puzzle pieces and interoperable networks. We do this by cultivating a relational field of the masculine and the feminine reconciled by sacred funding. Now, what does that mean in practice? On the masculine side, we have the wise interoperability stack. This is what Brad and James and Lawrence and uh, Day, all these people have been essentially trying to make the puzzle pieces work together. And not to mention Adam as well. Adam becoming a very core part of how we can create um, um, technologies or networks that aren't locked down in terms of interface or ownership. 
So yes, that would be our social technology stack. And a proof of how we've, you know, what we've done as World Wide Web is how we've kind of integrated um, the agent-centric framework of Adam, as well as the centralized database of Wico. Um, excuse the wording, this is a little bit, yeah, me having fun with it. But, and how we're using the open data commons as a way of reconciling this agent-based framework and a centralized server client architecture. And this is a you know proof of how we've actually done this. And if, if you look at the new narrow documentation, um, they talk deeply about the portable communities. And to build a tech of it um, takes time. But the vision of the portable communities is very clear in the new narrow um, documentation. And having using the Adam neighborhoods tech to essentially solve that, you know, saves us all crucial energy. And we can really work on what is really good at. So this is like a case study of what we've done as World Wars Web on the masculine side of things. And on the feminine is convening and wisdom practice. And our current meeting structure is broken down into three, where day one, we have secret practices, where we play glass speed games, essentially hold a circle and have everyone speak into that circle, right? And day two is uh, the feminine. And this is where um, we use um, tools like gather.town, where a circle is not effectively maintained. And that allows you to like walk across, talk to people that you're interested, create your own subgroups. And that becomes a very important gossip mechanism. And essentially like, yeah, telling people, hey, um, what needs to be known. And, you know, it's, it's a good way of essentially for bees to pollinate and move around ideas and topics between the groups or the clusters that form. And here we would show some of the wisdom practices we've done, like including glass speed games and things like that. And we will show some fruits from the wisdom processes and the conversations and things like that. And the masculine and the feminine need to be reconciled by something we want to call sacred funding. And if you were creating an ecosystem, um, a good analog to call from in the VC world, in the startup world is a venture studio where there are um, subunits or let's say there is a marketing team, there is a fundraising team, there is a um, tech team. And if you bring in an idea, the seed of an idea and plant that within the venture studio, it can grow it up. Similarly, we wanna create something called the venture commons for people to create impactful ventures and have all of the support they need for doing something like this. And the, Sorry, slides are a little bit out of control. So on the feminine side of things, we have something called matronage. This is where players sign on and uh, write what are their basic needs as in per cycle on a one month cycle, how much monetary um, remuneration would they need to like keep playing, right? And this does not come with any expectations of competence or, or uh, forming a team or anything like that. What, what are you bringing in spirit? And how can we enable that to happen? That's level one, that's matronage. And level two is patronage. And this is where we are talking about creating micro hierarchies and using conviction voting in order to feed these micro hierarchies to get shit done, right? Now, um, as from this presentation today that we've had, um, the concept of decision trees fits very closely with this. And so it is um, public sphere technology as, um, Jacob put it, because um, if, if you if you think about something like Gitcoin and the way it does funding um, is to show you all the projects on a randomized grid where Gitcoin as an organization does not put any sort of bias on what the projects are. And that is a good story or a good framing for doing public goods funding where you don't want to essentially say that the network is favoring one group over the other. But that's not the case when it comes to an innovators network where we want the funds that come in to stay in within the ecosystem as long as possible instead of, you know, none of the teams working together. So um, here what we would like to do is um, use the Holonic framework or the decision tree framework with the graph framework in order to create um, project proposals that people will put up and ask for conviction voting on. Now, if you put down a project proposal, you will also put down a hierarchy of who are the people that's going to be working on it and how you're going to be distributing the funding if you're even interested in telling that out. As far as we're concerned, this is a project proposal that needs to be fed and needs conviction 
um, from the rest of the players to say that this is the project that we want to fund. With the ability of um, decision trees or graph-based um, irrigation, um, what we can essentially do is, let's say someone creates a highly technical frame, a highly technical project proposal that like, you know, 90% of the people don't get. There is an opportunity for somebody else to create a new project proposal that is better in its storytelling, better in capturing people's imagination, and then explicitly say 90% of the funding from this project proposal will be going to that original technical framework. And this kind of um, opening up of um, quadratic funding or conviction voting in such a way also allows people to create dependencies where we need this project to work out. And so we know that we will have to send money and make sure that they get their needs met. And once this project gets funded, then I would like to do this project proposal and things like that. So that's level two where competence and voting by um, looking at your green check uh, reputation, your domain expertise would become extremely valuable using this conviction voting mechanism. And where does it become sacred funding is these uh, level one of matronage and level two of patronage will be reconciled by wise advisors. And this is where we use our advisors to essentially decide let's say we were able to raise $5 million, our advisors will decide how much of that funds will be accessible for the players of the World Wide Web um, per cycle. And they also get to divide how much of that money goes into matronage and how much of that goes into patronage. Matronage is unconditional money where once the money is sent to the players, they can essentially um, fund each other's needs by looking at them on a leaderboard of sorts. Make sure everyone's needs are met. Once the basic income is there, how would you donate that money as a player is essentially the game of matronage. Another patronage is the competence-based uh, funding of resonant micro hierarchies. And the and the advisor's job or the lever or the, the power that they have is to essentially define the nature of the World Wide Web. Do we want it to be more matronage? Do we want people to bring in more ideas, create the caring e economy so that good conversations are had? Or do we want to get shit done? Do we want to instead bias the funding as a way of um, getting a fire under people's butts and you know getting people to get shit done? And so all this is great. Um, innovation is great, but uh, adoption is the key. Today, social media works on people creating value for the network, uh, the network capturing the value, and the people getting dopamine hits at its worst, most reductionistic. You know, it's just cool content for you to look at, but at its best, probably the effect of a network where you are able to create and find like-minded people. But um, if you're going to solve the meta crisis, how do you create a social network or what do people get rewarded in? And this is where we want to essentially understand that we are creating ecosystem capital by creating something called the World Wide Web. And by scaling our venture commons and network, we make it attractive for exit with deep interoperable impact certifications. Now, um, looking at the green check graph technology, something that it really does well is to, for folks to bring their own folksonomies in order to tag things. And the next step we will be doing for that or to really um, unlock the power of it is to be able to translate from one person's folksonomy into another person's folksonomy. And so if you bring that same technology into impact certifications, or certifications of any kind, you are essentially creating a reputation translation system. Someone who has a degree certificate from Harvard has something of value in terms of credibility and reputation. Now, how do we translate that into, let's say, somebody else's impact certificate? What does getting a, a high civilian honorary award in India mean to someone who's in Germany? What does that tell you about the person, right? So how do you translate from that and project it onto somebody like your own sort of um, understanding. So this becomes what we can do in terms of exit. We can create deep or entry as well, which is you can bring in, instead of being locked into some other ecosystem, our ability to translate and really respect you on what you're respectable for becomes the strength that we have. And um, the wisdom gardens are a way of essentially, actually I'll skip this because it might not add to the conversation here. 
And um, we can also design level three and level four where retroactive funding for the people who contributed or mutual credit sort of funding and um, things like that could be additional innovations. And um, in terms of the three horizon, the breakdown of the World Wide Web would go into horizon one. We make sure that we have the patron, the matronage so that we can all keep playing. We have our basic needs net and we can work on our propolis graph where we interact with each other and create a strong propolis between the players. And horizon two is where we will develop our patronage and get shit done. And that's where we get shit done by our decision trees and um, uh, funding resonant micro hierarchies. And horizon three will be the profit to market fit. How do we tackle that once we have the tech substrate built? How can we take it to the ground or take it to the market and do wise business and um, get make, make sure that the ecosystem can stay alive besides just funders. So this is what our promise is, I guess, to the funders. Um, which is we are not uh, promising returns to any of our funders, but we are promising a story. And um, if you have done good, your story will stay alive because of how the memory stays and how the impact certificates stays. And um, yeah, the ask that we have for our whales is we have been playing for two months now with courage and trust, three months at this point. We need funds to keep playing with love and to scale to the world. From your wise investment, we will build and grow our wise commons. So that's the template as we have right now. Um, still a work in progress, needs definitely a lot, but I'm happy to hear from anyone if you've got something to say. Thank you, Rishi, that was great. Yeah, um, comments, critique, um, some of the wording might not be the best. And um, yeah, things like that. If you've got any ideas or any, I mean, if you could kind of like play the role of a whale and kind of like, you know, poke holes, that would also be great. Hey, it's Charles here. Just, um, and yeah, great, great. Great to, to just jump jump in a pool and swim, Rishi. That was awesome. Uh, I'm thinking maybe on behalf of those who don't have the context, maybe just a refresher on the, uh, the the distinction of the audience for that versus what what happened in the earlier the main part of the session. If in case that wasn't clear for anyone. Sorry, Charles. Would you? So I was trying to unmute. Yeah, I was just wondering if you if you might recap the the context for that presentation because I'm not sure if everyone got the distinction for the who was the audience for that compared to um, the the earlier part. Right on. So um, yeah, this is not for um, the crowdfunding side of things. This is essentially us trying to approach the whales, the big funders, and um, trying to understand how can we best package what we do into their sort of frames. So things like impact certificates is stuff that most of the funders understand. Things like um, venture studios, um, all that kind of thing is someone is something that they understand. Um, how can we best package what we are really doing? So at Limicon at this um, presentation, we were really taking it to the crowd and um, talking through our innovations and the tech that we're building and things like that. But um, how can we how can we best package 
the value that we provide to these funders um, is a question of, or, yeah, it's essentially what I'm trying to like, I hope I can get some feedback on. Excellent. Please, Bernard. Right. So first of all, thank you for just jumping in and presenting that. Um, I just needed a bit of time to think what I actually could give feedback on. Um, and my reaction that came up was mostly, oh, I need a bit of time to digest what you've given me to give advice. <laughs> um, so I guess the only feedback I could give right now is that I have to process what you have, the, the story you have given me. So I cannot immediately act on it from seeing this. So this is the only feedback I can give at this point, I think, right? So it, what was at least complicated enough for me that, ah, I like this element, I like that element, but I, I haven't been able to grasp the whole story. Um, yeah, so I guess the offer I'm giving with this is um, happy to jump in with a bit more prep time um, to put more precise things in. That's it. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's crucial feedback because if you give too much of a meal or there's too many things into it, um, yeah. There would be it'd be hard to digest. Yes, true. This is Michael. I'd, I'd like to thank you for something super super quick. Just to say that the the, the six month play along again, where we're at the midpoint. Um, the we're supposed to coordinate in order to coordinate. In other words, the deliverable or the outcome at the conclusion would be that we will have coordinated. Just to add another voice to the, thank you again for uh, presenting. Um, I too, like Bernard, I felt uh, it was a lot. Um, so I could only share some preliminary impressions. And the idea of separating uh, matronage and patronage in some ways seemed brilliant, and then others seemed a gender-based uh, explanation. And so it, it, it had both a sweetness and a bitterness to it both. And particularly the sequencing of of making level one, uh, I think, matron and level two patron, I thought that that could trigger reactions by different people. But, but the very idea of bringing um, uh, the two energies into a dance, uh, I thought was very powerful. And it might be yin and yang or some other way of doing that. But uh, uh, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, to, to um, echo uh, Bernard's comment, I think that, and my point earlier on about thinking of ourselves as a startup, um, this isn't a startup funding deck, right? It's, if, if it's a startup funding deck, we, it, it needs to be much, it re require a lot less of what Bernard referred to as processing, like to figure out what, what's being proposed. And I think that was the motivation behind the stack. If we can if we can get more and more refined about what we agree on the stack. And then I think the next step is, what would our use of funds be in service of that stack? Uh, if we get $100,000, where would it go? What's our budget, right? As opposed to we're gonna emergently decide it. Um, I think we're a small enough group that we don't, we don't need to invent new systems to figure out what we would do with 100,000 or $200,000. And I think funders would be a lot more ready to fund if we said, given in order to, so phase one would be X, Y, and Z, right? And the budget for X, Y, and Z is $200,000. Um, and I think we need to be very explicit about that because then it doesn't require what Bernard uh, referred to, you know, in terms of processing. It's like, oh, okay, I see what, I'm, what my money is going towards.
Um, could you speak to that, Daryl? Um, moats in the sense moats for investors or? Um... Sure, sure. So, so there's definitely some value of investors of also making a difference and feeling good about that and being valued socially in that. Um, is there any like founder appreciation that, or celebration or access? Like what, where is, where are the exclusions going to happen? Or, or can, can we see where they might happen? That would be an incentive for a contribution for, for whales. Can you speak a little bit more about the exclusion side of things. I understand the sure. incentive. Sure. Uh, my, my, my working understanding is that, um, value comes from a moat or an exclusion, a containment that, and, um, we're, I think we're trying to redefine those exclusions. And I think we're trying to show how exclusions are causing a lot of problems in the meta crisis. And yet. I also think there's probably some new, and I, we don't know what they are yet, but it's, you know, this, this coordination to, be, to coordinate is, I think, also looking to see what they, the counter, where is the non-coordination happening? Yeah, maybe Rad has an answer, insight. Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, I mean, I, I see, so but one trajectory is um, if, that we're talking about a social substrate that encompasses the entire regenerative movement, right? As a, an opt-in invitation uh, social graph, right? And that has a lot of value. And I think the exclusion, if I understand what you mean, is that that social graph is only accessible to applications, to an application ecosystem that um, ascribes to the principles of that of the entity, right? And so I don't see, you know, LinkedIn is one of the, one of the few of the large social, social systems that I think is um, disintermediatable. It doesn't have any real defensible um, there there other than just its, its sheer volume. And that I think that it, you could, that it, it's a very doable, Facebook is a much harder thing to replace. But um, but I think LinkedIn, you could get to a million person uh, social graph that has a, has a lot of value that then could be, but it's only accessible to to um, compliant applications. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, Dwayne Daryl, on uh, exclusions. But yeah, can um, can you see a world see somewhere in this graph where we? document exclusions hey this group of people or this person is in the is in our our list also of like stay away or don't do business with them because they're not regenerative or they're not and, and ah, i see what you're saying yeah well i think that's a natural outcome of um conversation but i think that's a natural outcome of this collective sense making is that you don't have to have uh specific personal expertise in order to to have you know that kind of knowledge yeah so so how, so this graph becomes valuable how yeah i can i can offer a little something which which points to green check and it, it has to do with the stigma j that was referred to earlier in terms of over time i think is, is really the answer to the question um, Daryl, in terms of of how 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 it's valuable, the, the graph and the relationships. I mean, this is the promise of a network states. This is Balaji stuff. I, I would say. Well, there are similarities and overlaps. That's true, but we 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 are aiming to be distinct. But Simon, go ahead. Well, I think this is a, an age old age old problem that we have. Um, a social network is valuable in the way that a, an ecosystem of, of nature is valuable. 
but we don't realize that value until we can extract it, until we can capture that value. Um, and this is, a, this is a problem with our existing system, that we don't realize this value until we can turn it into money. And um, this is a, a problem that we really need to be able to solve as a, as a species um, to be able to overcome and to be able to grow. Now, the real value is in what we create, in what we grow and how it serves us. Um, now, of course, we need to be able to pay people to develop it. And that's the challenge. Brad. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to, I, th I think instead in our case, we don't need to think about capturing the value as so much as the value is to participate in the ecosystem, right? If, if you're not compliant with the principles, you don't get to participate. But if you do, you get to be, you know, the, just participation is the value. Does that make sense? So, uh, you know, I get to, you know, uh, uh, you know, enjoy some of the nutrients that are in the soil. You know, I, it's, you know, I, it's, um, I don't think that you have to be um, taking value away from others in order for it to be valuable to participate. Yeah, it does, it does make sense. And the more people that are participating, the more people can, um, the, the more exchanges there can be, right? And so, so right. Somebody, somebody can be participating in one way um, by lending their time and their energy in, and their expertise in building something. Somebody else might be participating if they are, um, you know, have been successful in this existing system that we built. They have lots of money and they want to leave a legacy for their children then perhaps they can help fund it. Um, so I want to add to that point with uh, like the event at Africa, where there was so much value that was generated by you know these sacred practices, and that's abundant value. It's sacred value. I mean, like you know, it's it's extremely abundant. So, and it's you know, if you were to capture it, you can capture it in terms of like pictures and photographs, right? of that the event that happened and like you have a story in it or something like that. But the value that is there is definitely uh, participatory and people would like to like, for example, if you want your child to use a good social media and you want a child to participate in a good social media, that is something we can offer as real value. Right. So that's how I think about it. Let's, uh, you know, all our systems right now are extractive. So participation, I think is a very powerful thing. I shared earlier in the um, in the a chat a, a, a book techno feudalism that um, Janos uh, Barafakis I think uh, put out and basically one of his critiques of um, of capitalism as practiced today uh, and technologically enabled is that um, it allows for for um, rent seeking. And uh, which doesn't add value, if you will, from what he calls profit, which is the amplification of value. In other words, it it is he has that profit is a, a regenerative dynamic versus rent seeking is extractive. And um, the I, I just wanted to put that several of these technological walls um, uh, can, in fact, inadvertently become the. The, the 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 moat controls the 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 um, rent seeking privileged privileging mechanisms and um, without without saying i have an answer simply to put that idea of like is this uh, how how is the amplification um uh, uh being balanced against the 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 inherent um the, that that some of these technological features automatically are biased towards um, uh, certain forms of rent seeking and extraction. So I know that's a theoretical question, but uh, as the group is seeking to compass, I just thought I would put it into the conversation. Thank you. I also have a, another philosophical reflection that is not an answer, but hopefully some fuel um, for thought is that what is 
what is nature's version of profit? How does nature create a profit? Well, part of that, or at least a big part of it, is actually waste. And what we, what nature does with waste is it reinvests that waste in building new systems and new complexity. Right? And so profit in nature is waste. Waste is profit. And um, we may even look at profit in our systems in the same way. And so we need to take financial capital and we need to compost it. We need to take that financial capital and reinvest it in more complex systems that are better at serving humanity and better at serving nature. Um, can also speak to the point of um, the tech that we build will definitely be open source, but the ecosystems that we built with the tech there is no reason that it, it will be open source or open to everyone, right? So um, the member-owned cooperatives idea, I feel, um, understands that. And uh, participation becoming um, essentially how we keep the ecosystem alive also makes sense to me. But yeah, I think that is what it is, like, you know, moving from a profit motive to a profit, uh, just because it's a pun. But to have good sense making of the world that you're living in and to live in an ecosystem that makes sense to actually play chess with people and not play chess with pigeons is something that I feel would be really valuable. Uh, yeah, Steve, like, yeah, we're definitely going to be flooded with like AI garbage on like every other social media platform. So we will figure out that we need exclusive, you know, exclusionary gardens, which if they are holonic, that'll be better. Like one person builds a garden, you build your garden on top of that garden, there's gardens that build on top of that. So where, you know, specificity of wisdom becomes extremely valuable. So holonics is very important. Anything else you want to add to that, Steve? Oh no, I just I was just mentioning I'm uh, currently working on trying to extend the whole green check uh, modality to allow um, us to exclude bots wherever possible uh, on the internet in what I'm calling human only places. So uh, you know I'm currently working on a white paper which i'm going to foist in front of uh brad and charles and maybe day in the next couple of days so sweet um, um you know on that on that subject steve um one of the things that's come up in the conversations with uh, nico and james is this idea of a human agent you know we talk about agent centricity and agents you know definitely can be all kinds of different things. But if you combine the concept of green check with you know, a software agent where you could actually have an agent that you can reliably tr trust, it has a one-to-one -one correspondence with a human being. Right, exactly. So it's, some human only yeah. places will allow those type of bots to be there when right. the person is there, maybe when the person's not there. But the idea is to have any bots that are uncorrelated with your base human identity or any of your allowed pseudonyms to be totally verboten. Or at least to be known to be that way, right? So no, that they no, can't no. be like, yeah. yeah. So they well, can be, they can be papers. The problem is that these bots are going to be super charismatic soon. So we can't right. even have them in our spaces if we identify them because they will make us our slaves. Right. Make that they will make us slaves, whatever. Okay. Right. <laughs> Hey, hey, Steve, are you working with uh, Adrian Gropper on his uh, his personal? As much as much as I can, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think he's really identified this problem yet in his own mind. 
as being a parallel problem to the one he's trying to address. But I could be wrong in that. I'm trying to get I, it. I, just, I, I feel like the protocol that he's working on would help to address the problem. So whatever. It, oh, it, def it definitely yeah, does. I'm just I, saying, yeah. you know, the larger picture, I don't know how much he has. That's all. Day, you're up for uh, expanding it all on fan or, or updating as far as, you know, green check fan. I was I was late into the room, so I don't know what has already been said. the The update on fan is that uh, I very reluctantly, like, kind of broke out uh, another little bit of, you know, uh, another fifteen hundred bucks out of out of pocket to get Christopher to try to push the um, the iOS app over the uh, finish line because my my main blocker in sharing it with people is that not everybody's on Android. So um, this should be a uh, a big win uh, just to just to kind of get the the demo app working in uh, in iOS as well. <laughs> That's a wow, yeah. That'd be cool. I mean, it, I expected it was going to be about six thousand bucks, but he's gotten most of the way there on the on the first fifteen hundred, and I just gave him another. So, um, but you know, I have no income, so that's that's where that's at. Fan is like, fan is great. Fan is a protocol. Fan is done, y'all. Just everybody should use fan. But the, the only thing that I'm actually working on is is demo apps. And that all the demo apps do is like comply with fan. So when people are like, oh, are you done building fan? It's like, yes, I'm done building fan. It's finished. It's the it's just the protocol. Nobody has to use this app in order to use fan. You know, you can you can build any kind of identity manager you want that uses the protocol. Um so what we're working on is the is the app that demonstrates the functionality of the protocol so that we can convince more people that it actually works. But yes, it already works. Yeah. Anyway, I guess that's my slightly bitter rant on fan. <laughs> well, I see it. I see it's, um, part of the evolution of green check is, and, and the net, network cooperative is that part of being a member of the network cooperative is you have to have a, at least one fan identifier that, that is attached to your green check ID. So that wherever you go, that you know that decentralized identifier is functionally equivalent to you as a human being. There's one other angle um, that I just wanted to bring up that's been kind of foregrounding itself, and that's the the bioregional people mapping that's been that we're working on. So if you think about green check praising or or marking, you know people marking. Uh, but with a, a place-based focus, um, it solves a huge problem, which is how do you connect mycelia between funders in the north and people who are doing the good work of rainforest protection and, and agroforestry in the, in the global south? And uh, I think in some ways, it's just a special case of praising or people marking, but I think it could be a powerful driver of adoption because in essence you could you have the, you could have this grand challenge of okay let's let's point to all the great people you know in, you know in the tropics who are doing this great work and all they have is a is a whatsapp phone number right so they can they can do that they can still get a green check id um with, with just their phone number and people who know them and know the good work they're doing can connect, you know, mycelia to them. And you can actually have like you can you can imagine a a um, you know a governance system that that has that's uh, you know um, you know globe uh, bio globally inclusive. All right, I'm pulling weeds while I'm talking. So I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm imagining a heat map of, of people making impacts, Brad, that, that will allow funding to, um, well, if that, if that heat map is also a, a landscape, then funding can trickle like water. 
Yeah, we've been one of the metaphors we've been using is this idea of an irrigation system where you have the have reservoirs of money, um, and then you have emitter systems, you know, different you know chains of of uh, of uh, nutrient distribution, and the and at every node in those chains is a smart node. It's it's somebody who, like uh, the example I use is if I want to support. Um, the regeneration of the elephant population in Kenya. I don't know the specific people to give money to, but I know somebody who could be a distributor of my money. Uh, and, and then they, they might even pass some of that distribution on to someone else's uh, judgment. Right. So, so you don't, you can get this optimal resource allocation through, through smart connections. Is that also a potential funding mechanism on the base for for the um, for the tech stack, on the basis that there is, I believe, millions if not billions of dollars of funding that is becoming available for regenerative projects, and if those regenerative projects need this technological substrate to be able to govern their projects and to be able to connect with one another um, and distribute funding, then Perhaps there is a, a, a um, you know, a percentage fee for holding your network and your governance protocol on this technological. Yeah, system. yeah, Rishi. Maybe that's a way of of um, tightening up the 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 pitch, especially around the the um, venture studio thing uh, and all the other dis discussions that are we have about resource allocation is basically just be more precise about um, the how how this social substrate makes resource allocation optimal in all kinds of cases right whether you're trying to support rainforest guardians or or tech development yeah i mean i, I follow very very closely what he said there right and uh, yeah that's that's going to be i feel that is what that like the deck really needs work on like the narrative stuff i got some good feedback there like starting with the meta crisis you know give some concrete example things like that but um as i see it the real i mean moat or innovation that we have is in like our funding mechanism so being very precise and clear about it seems important from the feedback you just gave me i i wonder whether it's a uh, good idea to talk about like on ground stuff what do you think i feel that might be like a little bit out of our domain at this point we are funding the innovators on the tech side of things but i haven't really thought about the the nature of the biodiversity side of things and i really do feel like maybe we should make another pitch for the on ground stuff but curious how would you feel um <clears throat> yeah, I, I think we're going to need to, we're going to need to unite them somehow. Um, I mean, what comes to mind for me is that, um, at least in terms of like the kind of matronage patronage is just cause of track tracking the etymologies here, like the, um, the rematriation uh, is fundamentally a part of the matronage. So maybe it's kind of like, when we're seeking funding, there's a portion of the funding that's just fundamentally is going into place. Um, there's, you know, I think one of the things that's that's come up for me lately has been this idea of these uh, place-based validator nodes, um, and, or like even the idea of kind of like proof of place, you know, as we've moved from proof of work to proof of stake to proof of place how about that um and uh and then as we were looking at this is like okay we've got a knowledge graph we know what a knowledge graph is and what a social graph is now it's becoming plain that it that what we really have is a social knowledge graph but um but the the next dimension that needs to be woven in there is it's a it's a it's a social knowledge graph it's a relational knowledge graph of people in place and um and fundamentally the placidness of the people is a part of the value like if i'm like hey 
I need somebody who knows something about this in this place. It is very much a thing that um, when I was talking to people, you know, that was one of, you know, this is one of the number one things that people want is to be able to connect with people near them. Um, and in fact, that like, um, you know, place in in effect is kind of the it's the it's what allows us to uh, to connect. I mean, we, we can create these virtual places. Um, but in terms of the, you know, our actual our actual bodies need places uh, to to manifest in, you know, and uh, and so I think Simon, thank you. Yeah, come in, come in here. Yeah, I, I love that day and it also it closes the feedback loop, right, because we are we are taking all of our energy from the elements from the earth, right, and we are creating this technology, we're creating a new sphere. And the problem that we have as a species is that we have closed this feedback loop that doesn't feed back this energy back into nature's processes. And so people on the ground in place working on bioregional regenerative projects is one way to close that feedback loop. Um, so I really like that idea. I just want to open the stage up for Lena, if she has any um, ideas, suppose. I just checked out flow funding, Lena, and uh, it looks very interesting. And it seems like you've already done quite a bit. So very curious if you have any experience to add there in terms of um, funding on the ground. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm just here um, kind of observing and learning because I'm currently going to be starting a project and I'm just, um, I've been looking at flow funding and I've been going to meetings and it's, I don't know much about it yet. So I'm involved with the network loosely, but it's looking really promising. So, so yeah, I just put it out there for planted the seed in case people wanted to kind of look into it. I am not in funding. So yeah, but, but if anybody's interested, I do know most of the people who run, um, run the organization. So yeah. Is there a link somewhere? I'm on my phone. I, um, did you share a link, Lena? Um, yeah, I shared a link in the chat. And what Flow Funding is, it was actually started by a younger Rockefeller, and she actually gives 90% of her wealth to uh, philanthropic organizations and different projects. And she created what was Flow Funding, and what Flow Funding is, is it's a uh, it's a collective of funders and project builders um, and the project builders, um, the project builders choose um, pretty much network each other's projects and collectively choose which projects get how much funding. And yeah, it's a really cool, um, it's a really cool model because um, the people are working directly with the funders and through that, um, they create a beautiful flow and there's integrity in the, there's total integrity because everything is pretty much from what I'm seeing. I've been to a lot of meetings at this point. There's like pretty much 100% transparency on where the money goes, where the money comes from. And the idea is that the trust network is built. So I put that in the link because that's, it seems to be in line with your vision as well of creating a really trust-based holistic um, network. And yeah, um, it's kind of curious because um, yeah, the Rockefellers actually created that system. So I'm still, I'm still a bit weary on what it really is, but um, so I, I tend to question a lot as we all should, right? Like when it comes to money and, but um, I, I've been with the network and going to meetups and meeting funders and it seems 
too good to be true almost though <laughs> so we will see but if anybody wants links they have like open meetings and stuff so yeah i can link um with more resources and updates on um on meetings and while i have a voice i've been listening i got invited by a friend by charles and um thank you all for um building this space and doing what you do um it's really inspiring and um thank you rishi for acknowledging the the <laughs> yes um there are very few women who enter these spaces so um so thank you and um thank you for calling on me and hearing my voice but um yeah thank you all and um yeah i guess telegram or signal i can uh i can link i can link to flow funding and through flow funding i found a lot of really amazing um other sources um i am doing research for my own projects but i would love to share i just um i don't know how much of this is geared towards philanthropy like you know like I'm not fully emerged in the tech world. So, um, so yeah, I'm just curious, like how it coincides, but I guess funding is funding, right? So, so yeah. I, I would love to hear more about your project. I suspect, you know, yeah, I'd love to hear more about it. And I, I guess I would just say like, I see this as a systems change initiative and like yeah. we're looking at like, you know, every, not, not just like the best lever, but like all the levers, you know, there's a, a multitude of, of, of tactics and I think it's, we need to have people on all dimensions. So. Yeah. And what I'm sensing. So right now, so I did a lot of work overseas in Sri Lanka, um, Years ago, I actually um, was part of um, a project that brought art and um, education into orphanages um, and refugee camps um, post tsunami. And um, when I was listening to <laughs> the projects and just like from my knowledge of the World Wise Web and WICO, um, there is such potential for you know for growth like I literally pictured in my head I was like okay I could start a project in um in uh Sri Lanka but then I could take it to Vietnam and literally have a team a multifaceted team and click a button on an app and connect everyone right and that's just and you know put out a message like worldwide and that possibility it's such a beautiful vision right that you could implement projects in like 10 different countries and through the click of a button we could literally bam this is the action let's do it like i mean that's such a hopeful place you know so thank you all um i had that vision and it really it put a smile on my face so yeah, money. How how do we fund these projects, <laughs> right? How how do we reach a point of yeah, just how do we reach a point of understanding? But yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Well, asking you the question you asked about philanthropy. I mean, from from my perspective, I don't really want to deal with people who are looking for a return on their investment. So philanthropy. There's a lot of money out there, and my feeling is a lot of it's sitting on the sideline or inefficiently distributed because Agreed. they don't have they don't have trusted um, mechanisms for for making sure that the money's going optimally to the right places. Right. I think I think if we do it right, um, those sources of money. I mean, I think Value Flows looks like a good example of people with a lot of money deciding, okay, there's a, there's a better way than each of us doing our own due diligence on projects, right? That we should, that we can, yes. we can do collective sense making about where to put the money. That's what I think if we, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And so if we do, 
if we do our job right, they actually see, you know, the venture studio, the whole financial irrigation system as basically just an evolution of that. And, right. and it, and it gets more and more efficient all the time and more and more trustworthy all the time. And thus anybody with resources, you know, mm-hmm. is going to see it, see their resources as part of the collective budget mm-hmm. of the whole system. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's, um, yeah, trust-based economy too, right? Where we, right. yeah, of course. I mean, the fact that we've gotten this far away from that, you know, like there was a time in history where we, there was a sacred economy, like we lived in a gift-giving society and we slowly just emerged into this really dangerous, um, dangerous capitalist system. So how how do we return back? That's always my question. How do we return back to ultimately the collective, right? To the vision. And one way that I like to look at capital is that for every dollar we make, right, we're helping one person. It's that ethos, that philosophy. So a million dollars could potentially help a million people, right? So how how do we make that happen and yeah there there are people with high levels of income who are also rooted in sacred sciences and that's what i'm noticing and those are the pe- meaning the heart right wisdom based economies so and understand the wisdom based economy systems they're hard to find but i think with a project like this and just in general, those are the people that need to be targeted, but they're so in the cracks. Like it's really rare to find and it's really rare to, for them to ever, you know, expose, but yeah, flow funding. I found them through a friend. I was a part of a network called, I am part of a network called Permatours and we do land building regenerative projects. Um, they organize those projects. That's another good link um, as Permatours. But um, my friend Sid, who runs Permatours now, she's the lead organizer of Perma- Permatours. She just started working for flow funding. So so they're all connected. And Permatours is, they throw events and stuff. So for visibility, that could be another good connection is connecting with Permatours and being like, we're creating, especially WECO, you know, we're creating this new infrastructure and through Permatours, through events, and it's a great way to network and find the right people. Um, so those are two, those are two links that I have that I think like could be good resources, permitors and uh, and merge, merge the regenerative culture networks and the tech networks, right? And this specific, especially Wico, Lawrence, um, yeah, and James, I mean, what you're doing is mind blowing. I've been uh, looking at Wico for a while now and yeah it's beautiful and i'm a huge 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 game glass bead um player but i also uh, yeah and it's really amazing to integrate that glass bead is being integrated in the infrastructure of wico because i believe that glass bead could be a really great fundamental tool for research in itself right so um, that's a whole nother conversation, like creating my idea. I have ideas around glass bead. Um, so, so yeah, which I've been a part of, um, there's actually a glass bead think tank. Um, it's a research center that's been around for 12 years. So, um, and they, they created what was called glass bead game theory, which I've been really looking into that's based on, um, Glass bead game theory is based, it's math based. So it's a mathematical, it's a math think tank based on glass bead and they're doing all this innovative research in game theory. So um, Lawrence, if you want that link or if anybody wants the link to that research center too, um, let me know. So so yeah, thank you all. Thanks for letting me speak and uh, 
man, you guys are, yeah, I, I am really grateful um, that the internet um, is, that there's emergence back into, you know, like that there's, we're going in a good direction again on the internet as well. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rishi. Thank you, Lena. Yeah. <laughs> and I have questions about, yeah, just um, the pitch. Yeah, I was like, thank you for explaining. I was like, I also felt like at least one example in the memo of the meta crisis should, should be mentioned, but the explanation as to why was really good. So, so yeah. Thank you, and yeah. <laughs> hey, Lena, I, I didn't totally understand your feedback. Could you repeat that again? Which feedback? Um, to the pitch that you gave, I did not um, understand. What oh, you it's OK. That was just a tangent. That was ten more tangential, so. Um, yeah, no worries. It's okay. It's okay. Rishi, I think, I think it was just the feedback of giving a, uh, some concrete example of the meta crisis. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I, was, I was just mentioning that, that, um, I intuited that too. I really felt I was like when, when you gave the pitch, I was also like, well, I I have an idea of what the meta crisis is, but as someone who might not know that term, you know, which investors might not know or like might not know what the meta crisis is. And if an example is given, there would be more of an immediacy just to show the urgency, right, of why this project, why this is important, like bring that in. Um, but Thank you, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that makes that makes all sense. Mm -hmm. Like, um, um, yeah, that was the only thing. Is, um, yeah, with I guess that's the only thing. Is why do we the question of why do we need this money? Why is this important when approaching investors asking they they want to know why this project is important, right? And we mentioned the meta crisis and mentioning even to the investors like you know like economic collapse like mentioning we need to do this now not like i don't know but yeah urgency i guess i don't know how to really mention that oh well, that yeah yeah so um, thanks yeah yeah thank you lena so uh, like any additional context i can offer is um we've identified a whale and we are like in connections and we'll be presenting on the 15th so Beautiful. the whale is a fan of people like Daniel Schmockenberger and really mm -hmm. understands the meta crisis oh, as a word. But, yeah, yeah. but I mean, I think it's still very valuable feedback that you just gave because we'll, you know, we will need to approach other people as well, or at least to build that out. Um, I, I, for me, the story that deeply talks about the problem of the meta crisis, um, yeah. what's most alive for me is like open AI and how they were given money and data in order to use do AI for good, but then now they are just another, they built another nonprofit arm and just making money at this point and just giving all their innovation to Microsoft because they invested in them. So that's a crucial story for me. Somebody started out using AI for good and then, you know, because of the profit incentive or yeah. that uh, they can't really, you know, they don't have the will to go against that. But, oh my gosh, yeah. AI is a whole nother whole nother beast right <laughs> mm. uh, I, wouldn't, sure. I want to tie that very quickly back to the idea of um value capture right and um our obsession with capturing value mm. is is part of the problem and, and open ai has been captured mm -hmm. right and um we need to find ways to fund our projects without allowing them to be captured mm. yeah um, that's and for me, just like Brad said, that has to come from regenerative finance, i.e. philanthropy, 
Um, there can be people expecting return on their investment. Yeah, a hundred percent. Agreed, agreed, Charles. That open AI, AI was never open, but it, it's not. Um, you know, even it, it, it at least pretended to be for a while, and now it's not even pretending. Um, I'd I'd like to throw out one other way of thinking about our pitch. Um, and I mentioned this at the beginning of my talk, which is, you know, capitalism is going to eat the world. I mean, it's, it, that's just kind of undeniable, right? In its current form, it's just going to eat the world. And how long is it going to take? Well, it's already, it's already done it. It's already. Did Brad drop off? Yeah, I think we lost you, Brad, about 15 seconds ago. Mm. Yeah, I don't see his um, avatar anymore. He's gone. He just got eaten. I guess that was his time. <laughs> Capitalism <laughs> came for him. <laughs> uh, one idea I think that's interesting, uh, Risha, just to point out about like, oh, which people are we talking to? I mean, obviously there's kind of a sense of like, oh, having different different decks for different people with, you know, with different ways in. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think at, at, there's, there's gonna be a conversation where the person's not only meta crisis aware, but they're, they're collapse aware. They're, they're aware that there's no forestalling the collapse and that we actually just have to be like, you know, ready for, for what's next, you know? Um, but I think there's also kind of introductory or elementary conversations that can be have had sort of pre decks. Um, in, in this case, we have, we, you know, I have a known, a known audience, but uh, they're in order for this to scale, we're obviously going to need to be able to have a number of different versions of the conversation. Um, one of the things that just continually freaks me out about the meta crisis and the obsession with complexity, and I brought this up in a call yesterday, so I won't rail on it for too long, is exactly this thing. It's it's the narrow optimization pattern around monetary accumulation that is the driver of all of this big complex meta crisis. So it's like while I appreciate complexity awareness and, and the interest in complexity and it's, yes, it's amazing how it's ramified and all of the different ways that it manifests. And what, when you, you dig down to the bottom of it, it's this, this is this one thing. And I would say like one way to look at that is like, do you see anywhere in the world, anywhere in the universe where, you know, meta crisis type problems you know, all of the, you know, the multipolar traps and all of the other stuff that, you know, is, is that these things are manifesting under conditions where there is no money involved. Mm. And, and, and I suspect the answer would be no, these dynamics don't appear where there's no money involved. I, that's, that's what I suspect. There you completely read my mind. It was what I was looking to jump in with next is, um, you know, the meta crisis is rooted in our economic system, in our monetary system. And um, being open about that is, is very difficult when you're trying to attract funding. Yeah. Uh, but we need to find a way to be able to do that. And, um, you know, we may be lucky that we find a benevolent whale who is willing to um, participate in this and, and give away financial capital as a gift to be able to fund this on the basis that they understand this problem but we we need to think very hard about different funding mechanisms and i, I actually don't think we've spent enough time thinking about this and i and i think that we may even have to invent something new to be able to, to succeed in it lena so I just quickly wanted to mention that 
Um, I'm not affiliated with them either. I've been doing a lot of research on wisdom-based funding recently. So um, there's a place called the Sacred Economy Institute, which is through the Sacred Science Institute. And I was just thinking about how um, this whole project is really, it's almost research-based and how that could be a really beautiful angle, um, right? If, you know, you could get funding for the, for the research and the, you know, um, and the development through an institution possibly as well, instead of like just direct funders, um, you know, so that was, that was another like idea that I was thinking when funding got mentioned, how this isn't, what I'm sensing and feeling is and thinking is that this isn't this is like a beautiful social experiment not experiment but social you know like just like yeah I mean I don't want to say experiment but how um yeah how institutions or schools could also be an avenue I don't know just came up and the sacred economy, the sacred economics institute in general might be interested. That's an awesome connect, Lena. Um, do you have a do you have a link on them, or are they easily Googleable? I had a quick look, I couldn't find it, so a link would be great, Lena. I will link because they are a small um, nonprofit through another organization, but I know I'm, I was affiliated with the Sacred Science Institute at one point, so I will find that link. Um, and yeah, I will find that link and um, give it to you as well. It's brilliant. It's an amazing, amazing group of people. Um, and they also have a think tank. So I'm sure that they would be really, really interested in this project anyway, no matter what, and that it would be a good connection. So yeah, I will find that link. Uh, I heard that we did the kind of the invitation to interested people earlier, but where are they actually meant to go? Like, where do they actually connect with us? Are we sending them to the wider welcome signal? Fred? Lawrence asked them to contact him directly. Is what is what happened earlier. So FYI, that's what happened so far. I would suggest the, the best place for as all to meet would be the Wednesday session in Gathertown. And I, I appreciate that um, people who have been engaging in World Wide Web six hours a week is too much, um, but it's the perfect place for people from outside to be able to um, engage with what's going on in the World Wide Web and meet people in there and have these one-to-ones. So that's Gathertown on Wednesdays at um is it 10 a.m eastern or 12 12 p.m eastern i can give a link Eleven AM Eastern, as well as, of course, reaching out to Lawrence. Uh, 
Thanks everyone for hanging out. Yeah, awesome. Thank you guys. I am going to drop off. Take care and hope to uh, see some of the people who have joined in today um, in the World Wide Web at some point. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we announce an end? Um, unless anyone else has anything else um, pressing or they feel like they want to share? Grab the rest of the chat, but I'm, I'm complete. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to have to sign off. But thanks, everybody. Yeah, I will also jump out. Um, I've been kind of waiting around to see it. Did we hear from Yang earlier or no? We got a, a few. We didn't. I don't know. Yang. Yeah, we got a few folks in here that I are like, I don't know whether they're actually here. <laughs> But it would be interesting to to get feedback from people that have been only listening the whole time. That would be kind of neat. I, I can say that Sid Code is away from keyboard. He, he's uh, just recording because he's elsewhere at the moment. But another buddy of mine. So. Uh, all right. Do we hear from our our chief place based? Systems Change Incubator Representative Roberto Valenti. Yes, we yeah. did. Roberto did an amazing presentation. Beautiful presentation. Thank you, Roberto. Sorry, I missed it. I guess it's it'll be on the recording that I might not ever watch. But awesome. Okay. Cool, cool. Great job. I everyone. guess that's a wrap. Yay. Until soon. Thank you all for coming. This was amazing. Good job.